this afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body Questions. Question number one is from John Mason. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliament Corporate Body what improvements can be made to committee rooms so that on-screen presentations can be seen by everyone present. John Pentland. The presentation equipment currently used in the committee rooms is portable equipment which, if requested, can be configured uh, to display presentations on multiple screens located around the room, thus allowing on-screen presentations to be seen by everyone present. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member for that reply. The, the reality is that last week I attended the cross-party group on industrial communities and the majority of people present could not read the presentation on the screen because the screen was so small. And last night, I again attended a, a cross-party group, this time on credit unions. And again, the people present could not see uh, what was written on the screens. And I wonder if the member would accept there's a certain amount of frustration uh, that we cannot cope with this uh, high-tech side of things. John Pentland. I think the member raises a, a valid question, but he will know as part of the Digital Pro, uh, Parliament programme, a pilot of audiovisual technology is, be, is being conducted in four meeting rooms. And feedback from that pilot will be used to inform future decisions on audiovisual technologies. And the current mobile presentation equipment used in committee rooms could also be linked to broadcasting system to ensure a committee meeting will broadcast providing sufficient notice can be given. Thank you. Question number two, Mary Scanlon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Parliament corporate body what evaluation has been done on the effectiveness of its training courses? John Pentland. The SPCB evaluates all learning and development. We request the post-course evaluation is completed by all attendees on courses arranged by the SPCB. The evaluations ask about the ease of booking, accessibility of the location, that they were satisfied with the quality and content, and how they will use the training in their role. HR uses the responses to make amendments to training courses when required. SPCB has planned changes to, to the delivery mo model for training provision, which will modernise learning and development. Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you for that helpful answer. I wonder if we can look at uh, staff who could benefit fr from training. Uh, I carried out my own informal straw poll uh, of some MSP staff to find that most staff have not had any training since 1999, apart from fire safety. One member did a half-day course on Word. Another walked out of a course, as she saw, as a waste of time. Some of the recent recruits have signed up for training only to find they're offered on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursdays only, which are the busiest days for MSPs and staff, and others hope that some training might be available in recess. So my question is, is it not time to carry out a training needs analysis of MSP staff to discover their training and development needs so that they are supported in carrying out their job effectively and efficiently and also to continue to grow and develop their careers. John Pentland. Again, that is a very uh, good question raised by Mary Scanlon and I'm sure Mary will know that there is a range of training available for MSP staff. For example, MSP staff can access a range of e-learning packages and attend the courses provided by the SPCB. Members can also access funds for training through the Members' Expenses Scheme, and this information can be found on the Parliament website. A supplementary question from Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Sometimes there is a perception that training courses are just a tick-box exercise and an excuse for a catch-up with no emphasis on outcomes. And I'm sure that's not the case with the Scottish Parliament staff. So could the member advise the Chamber what the Scottish Parliament staff experience of training provided is? John Pentland. I'm not too sure if the, the, the member is aware, but there was a recent staff experience survey shows a very high degree of satisfaction with learning and development provided by the SPCB. 89% of the staff feel that they have fair access to learning and development opportunities. 90% felt that they had opportunities to develop their skills and experience in the last year. And 88% believe that the learning and development opportunities that they have had have helped them to do their job better. 
Many thanks. <coughs> Question number three from John Wilson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body what assessment it has made of the use of business sponsorship for Parliament events. Linda Fabiani. I thank you, Presiding Officer. It is an ongoing assessment because when the SPCB consider a programme of major events, we also consider the merits of business sponsorship, always looking to enhance, of course, and extend our activities as appropriate. It's very important to say that any agreed business sponsorship, when we look at this programme, should add to the event or the exhibition. And we would always, of course, consider any potential reputational risk to our parliament before agreeing to any sponsorship. I'd like to give two examples. An ongoing one is the Festival of Politics, where we work in partnership with a number of organisations to enhance that festival experience. And another recent one was where the SPCB worked in partnership to de deliver the world-class exhibition, which was Andy Warhol, Pop, Power and Politics. And we secured funding from external organisations to bring that exhibition to Scotland. Thank you. John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank the corporate body for that response. On the 14th of April this year, it was announced that the Parliament building was to be rented out for receptions and dinners as an expansion of an existing pilot programme. The guidelines outlined by the Scottish Government on sponsorship of corporate events state that sponsorship arrangements must not compromise the dignity or public standing of the Government and sponsorship must not be accepted from inappropriate sources e.g. companies with dubious and doubtful background. With these points in mind, could the corporate body indicate why it was deemed acceptable to accept donations from a company called Lockheed Martin, who are clearly involved in a number of areas in the world stage, not, not only including the production of Trident nuclear weapons, which this parliament has on several occasions voted uh, against Linda Fabiani. Uh, there are actually a few, a few different issues in there, Presiding Officer, because what has been brought in was, is a, a separate issue uh, to what the, the original question was, but business sponsorship for Parliament events. And we're now looking to at the pilot that's ongoing for commercial events. So let's separate these two completely separate issues. However, in, in reference um, to the particular Parliament event, um, which has been mentioned uh, by John Wilson with uh, Lockheed Martin. That was the, the Scottish Public Service Awards. Now, the Scottish Parliament co-hosted the Scottish Public Service Awards 2014 because it was an appropriate venue for these inaugural awards which recognised the achievements of public servants from right across Scotland in many, many different organisations. And indeed, Lockheed Martin was one of a number of companies who sponsored the awards, not the sole sponsor. And of course, Lockheed Martin is one of the largest public sector suppliers of IT systems. Thank you. Question number four is from Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the SPCB whether its practices comply with the open data strategy published by the Scottish Government and what action it will take to address the issues that it raises. Uh, Linda Fabiani. Can I say to Patrick Harvey that we had a discussion at the corporate body as to whether the right usage was data or data, and I decided to use whichever one Patrick Harvey didn't <laughs> in the interests of fairness. So I'm going to talk about the open data strategy. Yeah. And of course, that sets out that public sector organisations in Scotland should publish open data publication plans by the end of 2015, with all data sets being published as open data by 2017. So I'm really pleased to be able to tell the Chamber that as of today, our first 60 data sets including ones and questions, motions and petitions have been published online, with more to be made available over the months ahead. So we do feel that we're on course to comply with the open data strategy well ahead of its deadline. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Sticking with the Star Trek pronunciation, personally, uh, open, open data is incredibly important, both in private and public sector organisations, but where more so than a parliament whose business is supposed to be transparent and accountable. One of the open data principles is around usability by all. Uh, would it not make sense to ensure that the record of our official report 
links very clearly through to the video record uh, of our proceedings as well to ensure maximum usability. If a person searches for a question, they should be able to easily click through and see the context in which it was asked, both in text and in video. Linda Fabiani. <laughs> One can always rely on Patrick Harvey to come up with a question that one has not had notice of from the officers who deal with it. <laughs> so can I say that that sounds eminently sensible to me? And uh, I could tell from the reaction of my three SPCB colleagues that they felt the same. It seems quite straightforward to us, but then again, we are not the experts who have to deal with the issues on data, which I am assured by my colleague is the Latin. <laughs> uh, therefore, uh, yes, we will get back to the Chamber on that one. Um, if it's more difficult than it would seem, um, we will let you know the reasons why. Thank you very much. And that concludes questions to Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body. And we turn to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 13358 in the name of Shona Robison on making progress on changing Scotland's relationship with alcohol. I'll allow a few moments for members to change places and could I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please. Good afternoon, everyone. And before we move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 13358 in the name of Shona Robeson on making progress on changing Scotland's relationship with alcohol, can I remind members that for the purposes of the standing order rule on sub judice, there should be no discussion in this debate about ongoing legal proceedings in respect of minimum pricing. I refer members to advice issued yesterday on issues that should not be raised during this debate. Presiding officers will ask any member who makes reference to these issues to stop doing so. The presiding officers will make full use of their powers if they consider any member is persistently breaching this rule. I now call on Shona Robison to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, you have 14 minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, Scotland's relationship with alcohol is something which has concerned this chamber deeply over the past decade and a half, and rightly so. We know that alcohol use is one of the, the top risk factors for non-communicable diseases, and all too often international comparisons place Scotland well behind the, the health curve of our European neighbours. I have called this debate today following very constructive cross-party discussions. I wish to enable a non-partisan and collaborative conversation which reaches right across this chamber. The Scottish Government's strategy, Changing Scotland's Relationship with Alcohol, a Framework for Action, has seen a good deal of progress since 2009, and what, much of that work remains ongoing. But we simply cannot be complacent and must look to the next steps for action in the medium term. And that's why I'm commencing today our cross-parliamentary consideration on where next for alcohol. I welcome suggestions and I look forward to substantive contributions uh, from all participants. Our 2009 strategy was based largely on recommendations made by the world's leading authority on non-communicable disease prevention, the World Health Organisation. These uh, World Health Organization priority actions are evidence-based and encourage countries worldwide to implement 10 priority measures on alcohol, including on pricing, availability and marketing and advertising, as well as drink driving policies, community action and health service programs, such as alcohol brief interventions. We're making good progress on the WHO recommendations and should all be proud that Scot the Scottish approach fares so well against the WHO checklist. Indeed, just last month, another world-renowned body, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, published a report on the economics of tackling harmful alcohol use. OECD further validated the, the Scottish approach, ad advising the most effective and economically prudent package should include fiscal and regulatory measures, healthcare interventions, and a strategy combining healthcare and regulatory measures. It's clear that international experts feel we're heading in the right direction. 
but we're not there yet by any means. There can be no dispute that one death associated with alcohol is one too many. And while there remains an average of around 700 hospital admissions and 20 deaths a week due to alcohol misuse, no morally responsible government nor parliament can rest easy. It's true to say that alcohol-related deaths have fallen by 35% since 2003, and of course I welcome that. But alcohol-related deaths remain 1.4 times higher than they were in 1981, and that concerns me greatly. Furthermore, I'm sure that every member will agree with me that the rise in alcohol-related deaths seen in the most recent data for 2013 is of very great concern indeed. And while it's too early to know if this rise in deaths marks the beginning of an upward trend, we must be alert to the possibility that alcohol-related alcohol harm may increase once again as the economic climate improves. It's highly likely that declining affordability due to the economic downturn in recent years is responsible for a substantial proportion of the improvements that we've seen in the very recent years. And that's why an effective pricing mechanism capable of responding to affordability is so very important, a view endorsed by WHO and the OECD. On pricing, of course, our European neighbours look to us as pi pioneers, with many awaiting the outcome of the ongoing minimum user unit pricing litigation. And of course, we have the support of many, and I would like to thank them for all of their efforts on this and so many areas, Alcohol Focus Scotland, the Scottish Health Action on Alcohol Problems, BMA Scotland, Eurocare, and the many uh, advisory bodies uh, across Europe and member states who have uh, shown their support um, on so many of our policies. So we'll wait and see, as the Deputy Presiding Officer said, this is not the place for the debate on minimum unit pricing, and that will be determined uh, in September. But our framework for action, of course, goes much, much wider uh, than that of minimum unit pricing. It contains over 40 measures which seek to firstly reduce consumption, to support families and communities, to encourage more positive attitudes and positive choices, and to improve treatment and support services. And we continue to take a whole population approach because alcohol use impacts upon people from every walk of life. While it's true that heavy drinkers consume by far the greatest proportion of alcohol drunk in this country, the harms of alcohol use can be far ranging. Even relatively modest consumption patterns increase the risk of non-communicable diseases such as cardiac disease and cancers. And of course, harm to others can manifest in many ways from impacting upon parenting capacity to potentially serious alcohol-related violence. Our journey has seen great strides forward. Time constraints don't permit me to go into every detail of the very significant progress made across, across the breadth of the strategy, so I want to just highlight a, a few examples. Firstly, our introduction of the quantity discount ban, which saw alcohol sales reduce by an estimated 2.6%. We've legislated to ban irresponsible promotions. We've made a record investment of over £278 million since 2008, of which £250 million has gone directly to the 30 alcohol and drug partnerships, which we've established to meet local priorities. We introduced a lower drink drive limit last year, a move now being called for in other parts of the UK, and which is already having uh, um, uh, promising results. We've improved substance misuse education through Curriculum for Excellence, being able to take that broad look uh, across health and wellbeing. And we've introduced a hugely successful nationwide alcohol brief interventions programme with over 470,000 ABIs delivered to date. And I want to just touch on this uh, for a moment. So I'm very keen that we're able to get to the harder to reach consumers of alcohol through this programme. And that's why we're doubling the capacity from this year for NHS boards to deliver AB, ABIs in wider settings from 10% to a 20% quota. Because health inequalities is one area which we need to focus on going forward. We have seen improvements in alcohol-related health inequalities in recent years, but death rates for those in the most deprived groups are still six times higher than in the least deprived groups. So that's why we're placing a specific emphasis on tackling inequalities through ABI's work. And we're also looking at how uptake can be facilitated in justice settings, such as custody suites and prisons. 
I want to return briefly to education because I'm sure there will be a, a consensus in this chamber that getting our messages right about alcohol is imperative. And that's why I'm very pleased to announce that this year the Scottish Government will develop a new social marketing campaign around parents and their role, particularly as role models, uh, in the, the run-up to early 2016. And we must do all we can to protect children and young people from exposure to alcohol-related harm. And that's why the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill creates new offences of supplying alcohol to children or young people for consumption in a public place, fulfilling a manifesto commitment. And that's why I'm sympathetic to the spirit of Richard Simpson's ideas around advertising and marketing, where he focuses on exposure of children to alcohol advertising. And I'm sure we'll have further positive discussion on that. So the moral imperative is strong here, and I look forward to finding where there may be areas of parliamentary consensus. And that brings me to one of the difficulties in taking a, a truly holistic approach to tackling alcohol-related harm. And that is some of the limitations upon this parliament being able to take action in some areas. While powers on broadcast advertising remain reserved, we, do, don't, we don't have the, the full levers at our disposal to protect children and young people from the more influential channels such as television and increasingly digital platforms, including social media. The devolution of broadcast advertising was not among the recommendation, recommendations to come out of the Smith Commission process, nor was the consultation this government requested on alcohol duty rates. With the Chancellor's recent abolition of the duty escalator, combined with cuts and freezes across various alcohol categories, which in my view only make alcohol more affordable, the case for the Scottish Government to have a say on UK alcohol duty has never been stronger. The devolution of weights and measure powers would also allow Scotland to, to further tailor our approach around serving sizes to complement the multi-buy discount ban. So my intention is in a positive and constructive way to take these issues forward with the UK government and hopefully try to arrive on some level of consensus that perhaps we can move forward on these issues on a UK basis. But if not, that Scotland has the appetite to move forward on these issues. The alcohol licensing regime currently being further enhanced through the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill already provides a robust locally led system for regulating the sale of alcohol. Local licensing boards are equipped to take decisions on license applications which take full account of the public health objective which Scotland has enshrined in the licensing system. Our national alcohol charity, Alcohol Focus Scotland, has been working to empower local players to present robust evidence to local licensing board to support their consideration of applications for premises and to help tackle issues such as over-provision. So I'm pleased to confirm today additional funding to Alcohol Focus Scotland for a new post to assist in this. This October, Scotland has the great honour of hosting the prestigious Global Alcohol Policy Alliance Conference, with international experts coming together to share knowledge and build capacity around tackling alcohol-related harm. And I very much look forward to engaging in constructive discussion at the conference about the latest thinking worldwide. I'm sure there'll be ideas that we wish to capture for Scotland, and perhaps ideas that others might want to take forward in the rest of the world. And I expect the next phase of our alcohol strategy to be ready in early 2016. So over the coming months, I urge all members to reflect on the progress that we've made on the journey so far since our framework's launch in 2009. I've laid out some of that here today, and hopefully there'll be a consensus that that has been a good start. Yes, of course. Richard Simpson. The, one of the things that the Parliament passed in 2009 was the potential for local authorities to undertake a responsibility levy, um, social responsibility levy, and the government had to produce regulations for this, but there's been a decision of your government not to enact that, and I wonder that was one of the ideas that came forward, which hasn't, has been, it is now in law, but you haven't acted upon, I wonder why. I, th I think the, uh, the short answer to that is because of the economic considerations and the economic climate 
of the day. And I think you've, you've heard John Swinney respond to the, 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 that point for that very reason, um, because of the fragility of some of the businesses that, that would be involved. But it's something, obviously, we would want to, to keep under review. But I hope that, that as I said, that there has been a, a large degree of consensus, not on all matters, but broadly that progress has been good so far but it hasn't certainly been alone from this government we've worked together with a whole range of partners including the NHS the police third sector organizations and indeed the alcohol industry um, and players within the alcohol industry there are many actions which must continue and there will be new ideas that we want to pursue and really the, the opportunity in this debate today is to begin to tease out where those areas may be and where there may be an area of consensus around those. But I, I also urge you, just in closing, that everyone should be cognisant of the likely impact that the economic recession will have had on Scotland's alcohol-related harm statistics. The impact of such harms continues to be felt across our communities, and only a, a comprehensive, sustained and preventative approach proactively addressing those key uh, WHO priorities can see us turn around our relationship with alcohol. That's not something that's going to happen overnight. We've now been working around this um, sustained alcohol strategy for uh, over six years, but even within that time frame, um, it's not long enough to change around Scotland's uh, relationship and culture uh, around alcohol and the way we behave with alcohol. That is a generational uh, issue and one that's going to take much longer uh, to see uh, begin to hopefully turn around into a more positive uh, relationship with alcohol as we go forward. But hopefully uh, through my opening remarks today, I've been able to give you a flavour of where I think we're on the right track and what we would want to continue. But where this government is very open to hearing ideas from all sides of the chamber and building a consensus about the next phase of the strategy, which we would want to bring forward uh, early next year as we work on it over the next few months. So a uh, pleasure in moving uh, the motion in my name. And I should say I'm also happy to accept the Labour amendment. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Jenny Mara to speak to and move Amendment 13358.1. Ms Mara, you have 10 minutes or thereby. Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Scottish Government for bringing this very important debate to the, the Chamber this afternoon. Presiding Officer, can I just say um, at the outset, I respect to your initial remarks on the sub judice issue, but I did want to say I was confused as to why a sub judice issue was then in a government motion. My understanding is that government motions set the parameters uh, for the debate. I raised this with the clerks yesterday and I was told that a sub judice issue could be included in a government motion for debate but could not be discussed. I'm, I accepted that explanation. I'm not sure it's an explanation I fully understand, but I just wanted to put that on the record. But with that also, um, I'm happy to say that uh, the Labour benches will be uh, supporting the government's motion tonight and I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for accepting our amendment. Presiding officer, I am um, sure that most of us, if not uh, all of us in this chamber and beyond the walls of this parliament, don't need to look very far in our own lives to see how alcohol can impact individuals, it impacts relationships, families, children, people's income, their work, their careers and their friendships. Today, we as a parliament, the Scottish Government, and politicians consider how public policy can reduce alcohol consumption to try to mitigate uh, the, some of these effects on people's lives. And the difficulty with this presiding officer is that alcohol is legal, widely available and sociable and in many ways a good thing. And it is ultimately up to our own volition and ability if its consumption can be moderated. Now, this is a very liberal argument, presiding officer, but it is one which I think is at the very heart of this debate. That balance between restrictions through legislation and public policy and control of our own uh, behaviours. And what can be such a good thing in moderation? A libation, a social relaxant, a treat, an enjoyable reward for celebration and hard work. But the tipping point 
into it becoming a culture, then into a crux and something that no event or social occasion can be without, takes us to the place that unfortunately many of our communities are in Scotland where too many lives are lost and too many lives are impacted by its devastating consequences. And we can't be under any illusion just how damaging alcohol is to Scotland. The briefings today um, have been very helpful and they point out that in this country there are 20 deaths every week due to alcohol misuse. Deaths from liver cirrhosis in 2010 was around 40% higher than the EU average. We drink almost a fifth more than, than our neighbours in England and Wales. And despite modest recent improvements, rates of alcohol-related hospital admissions in Scotland are over four times higher than they were in the early 1980s. Our presiding officer, harmful drinking is not a problem unique to Scotland. But seeing our name right up top of the league tables on every measure of alcohol abuse is a deep stain on our image and pride in our country. I have touched on its social and human impact, but I think it's very important not to forget in this debate its effect on our economy and our ability to work and be productive. And that must also be a crucial element of this debate, as well as the human cost and the health impact. We know that rebalancing Scotland's relationship with alcohol is a shared ambition across this Parliament and there is a range of views on how we best achieve this and also a lot of consensus. And I would like to acknowledge the Scottish Government's commitment to this issue as, we, as noted in the motion. It is difficult with no easy or simple solutions if we are to bring about that change of culture that we require. The ban on multi-buy discounts and the other measures highlighted by the Cabinet Secretary I'm sure will have played a significant role in the recent fall in consumption, although economic downturn itself is acknowledged as another factor. And we welcome some of the modest improvements that have been made. Scotland was the first country in the world to implement the long-established effectiveness of alcohol brief interventions into a national programme. That the programme has outperformed its initial targets is an excellent commendation for the programme to be continued by the Scottish Government. The reduction in alcohol-related deaths among the most deprived people in Scotland signals a very small start to reducing health inequality, which we must welcome and fully support. And the 35% fall since 2003 in alcohol-related deaths, that figure still leaves deaths 40% higher than in the 1990s, according to uh, the Scottish Health Action on Alcohol-Related Problems. And as the Cabinet Secretary said, the rise in alcohol-related deaths recently, since 2013, is very concerning. But it doesn't challenge this overall downward trend. I also welcome the constructive way in which the Government has approached uh, today's motion and the Cabinet Secretary's willingness to consider, consider other additional measures. And in that respect, I would hope that the Scottish Government would give, give consideration to the measures being put forward by my colleague Dr Richard Simpson in his Members' Bill, given his undoubted expertise and passion for this subject. Presiding officer, if I may um, take you briefly through some of the proposals in Richard Simpson's bill, as I don't want to leave it just to the closing speeches, as I would like some of these issues to be debated today. But in a whole range of areas, in alcohol advertising, retailing and in licensing laws, and in how we rehabilitate offenders with alcohol problems, the bill does have some very constructive proposal, proposals. Packaging up multi-packs and selling them off so each unit is cheaper encourages heavy drink, heavier drinking, and there are proposals here. Restricting alcohol marketing, especially where children may be exposed. Now, this is within the scope of the current Scotland Act to do this in public areas, on billboards, bus shelters and public transport. I noted the Cabinet Secretary's initial comments that broadcasting is reserved to Westminster, but I'm sure with the increase in representation that, that her party has uh, recently enjoyed in Westminster, they can make the case along with, with our colleagues there too. Restrictions on caffeinated alcohol. Seeing 
seeking to establish a legal limit of 150 milligrams per litre of caffeine of pre-mixed alcoholic drinks based on the limit in Denmark applying to the retail of such products only. Not an outright ban, but um, a, a restriction. That is one of the proposals in Richard Simpson's bill also. Alcohol education, which I know the Cabinet Secretary will feel strongly about, requiring the Scottish Government to publish a programme of public alcohol education and undertaking to evaluate its effects and report to Parliament on its successes. Another, another idea and, um, in Richard Simpson's bill is a presumption against discrimination against 18 to 21-year-olds in off-sale premises. Community consultation, presiding officer, to adopt an approach similar to New Zealand, whereby the neighbourhood is consulted and must have their views taken into account by the licensing board when issuing, when issuing or renewing or extending a licence. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of this example. It may sound overly bureaucratic, but there was a situation in our home city of Dundee recently where the Health Board objected to the application for a local cafe to sell alcohol. Now, the Community's Council's voices were not part of this process. So perhaps a community consultative approach, as Dr Simpson has proposed, would be a more inclusive and constructive way of engaging the community in licensing decisions, as proposed, rather than simply having a process where organisations can lodge uh, and individuals can lodge objections directly to the licensing board. That was some of the proposals based in, um, in Labour and Richard Simpson's bill. I hope they will be discussed at greater length during this debate. Presiding officer, we know that Scotland is changing, and I hope and I believe that our relationship with alcohol is changing too. I think we would be silly to deny that the macho culture of hard drinking does still exist in our communities and, and much of it is ingrained in our identity and is still celebrated and joked about in an unhealthy way. But there is no doubt, and my strong sense is that people today, especially young people, have a greater awareness of their health and they have a stronger desire to live healthier lives and they do have an understanding that too much alcohol is not compatible with this. In time, I think, our health service and our justice system will see the benefit of that. But we must do much, much more to make sure that that trend is ingrained and does continue. Particularly with our NHS, as our, the pressure on our doctors and nurses grows every day. Our ambition for a healthier Scotland, for people from all backgrounds, educated and empowered to make better decisions with healthy bodies and healthy minds, is one we should be working towards every day of this Parliament. Presiding officer, tackling harmful drinking is a big part of that, so we can look at the progress over recent years and take some comfort while also recognising the long, long way that we still have to go. Presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Jackson Carlow, six minutes or thereby. Please, Mr Carlow. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I've pointed out before that uh, Scotland's very sharp uh, deterioration in its relationship with alcohol in terms of both hospital admission rates and alcohol deaths can be traced back to the end of 1990, when, by coincidence, uh, Margaret Thatcher left Downing Street. Now, whether that therefore led to rejoicing in the streets, a binge party from which Scots never recovered, or whether in fact it was that Scots were consumed by grief at her departure. It nonetheless is a fact that the very, very sharp deterioration in our relationship with alcohol uh, from that point onwards uh, is measurable. And before members of the SNP get too excited to draw a conclusion one way or the other, it's also the case that the improvement in hospital-related admissions and deaths began when Alex Salmon came to office. So whether this was because people no longer felt like rejoicing on the streets and had given up on life, I don't know. Uh, but those small improvements we've seen, I think, are to be celebrated. But I don't know if we can be complacent 
as to what might have underpinned that change in trend to which I'll return. Now, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for holding the debate this afternoon. I, I did say in a, a question not so long ago that it was two years since we'd passed minimum unit pricing and, and two years since we'd last debated the subject in the Chamber. And uh, the First Minister got a bit excited. I didn't mean by that to criticise the ongoing work that was being done. But that during the course of that debate, it was underpinned by a determination that we needed to understand and address the relationship between Scotland and alcohol. And that, I think, needs a sustained and continuing debate in this chamber. And that uh, legislation was passed really in the salad days of this parliament, if I can call it that. Uh, and we have a chance to look at the issue again today, for which I'm grateful. Now, there have been improvements, some maybe not so obvious. I mean, in 2013, we had uh, twice the vodka off sales uh, in Scotland of any other part of the United Kingdom, so we still have trends that we might not wish to celebrate. And as Jenny Mara and the minister herself said, uh, consumption versus the 1980s uh, is still at twice the rate of uh, France, Portugal, Spain, uh, and, Fra uh, and, uh, uh, and another country that I've written down incorrectly, <laughs> which isn't very helpful. And it's four times uh, the rate of hospital admissions that we saw in the 1980s. Now, I acknowledge the work that's been done in the measures, the uh, improvement as a result of the alcohol framework, the fact that we've seen a 2.5% reduction in off-trade sales, uh, and the better investment in treatment and care and alcohol brief interventions. But it is also the case that that deterioration in our relationship with alcohol on another graph can be directly compared to the affordability of alcohol over the same period. And in the findings from monitoring and evaluating Scotland's alcohol strategy fourth annual report in December last year, I was struck by this paragraph, the declining affordability of alcohol due to the economic downturn and associated policy context across Great Britain in recent years is responsible for a substantial portion of these improvements. However, the ban and quantity discounting of alcohol and the increased number of ABIs delivered are likely to be contributing to the improvements seen in Scotland. Changing knowledge and attitudes around alcohol are unlikely to be responsible for the recent declines. And so we still have a huge job to do, I think, in the whole identification of uh, culture. Now, young people are drinking less, according to this. Yes. Richard Simpson. Accepting the report of Misas, which he's correctly uh, alluded to, and nevertheless, the decline in deaths began in 2003, which was a time of minimum unemployment, the best unemployment we've seen figures since we've seen since the 1960s. So I think that that, that should be greeted with some caution. Well, does in fact acknowledge the point that Dr. Simpson makes. But nonetheless, if the increase was uh, directly attributable to affordability, it may be that part of the downturn in the last few years may have an issue, uh, may be related in part to affordability as well. As I said, there's been an a reduction in the number of young people drinking. We've seen, as the Cabinet Secretary said, uh, a, a reduction as a result of the new alcohol limit uh, imposed in relation to driving. Although I would be interested uh, if the minister could comment on what I've heard some people say anecdotally, which is that there was a reduction in the number of people who were stopped and breathalyzed over the uh, winter period immediately uh, last year as a result of extended leave being taken because of additional work patterns during the Commonwealth Games. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, um, but I hope it's not, because I hope that the uh, legislation that's been passed has contributed in that way. Yes? We certainly have a look at that, but I get the sense, anecdotally, um, which we need to build the evidence base for, and I'm sure this will exist, that actually people are just not taking the risk anymore. And I think that does change the culture. Um, well, I hope that's very much the case, and I hope that the figures that we've seen, which are encouraging in one year, are sustained going forward, and if successful, are employed across the rest of the United Kingdom too. The principal challenges, therefore, are on culture and on hospital admissions to try and reduce the burden on the NHS. Now, I thought what Simon Stevens had to say yesterday was... How long have I got, by the way, President? A little longer. Yeah. I thought what Simon Stevens had to say yesterday was very interesting because it touched on something that both Hugh Henry, Duncan McNeil and others have said, and that is the need for people to become more responsible about understanding the, the relationship they have with their own health care going forward. And I think that if people are now going to understand 
that they could live much longer lives, potentially into great old age. I think we have to begin an education process at a much earlier stage where we identify to people that the quality of that life in the last 30 years can be dramatically compromised by the decisions and the ways in which we interact with our own health at an earlier stage. I think our health education policies tend to isolate our understanding of particular uh, actions that we can take without necessarily trying to incentivize people, since the health service can never not treat people, but without trying to incentivize people to understand that the quality of life they can ultimately enjoy will be dramatically affected by the decisions they take. And we need, I think, to start demonstrating, particularly to people who are not necessarily addicted in a sense to alcohol, but who simply over a sustained basis drink too much without properly understanding the issues for the cirrhosis of the liver that may materialise in later middle age, the effects that that could have. I'll have more to say in summing up, presiding officer, but at the moment uh, I'm happy to support the motion and also the amendment in the name of the Labour Party. Many thanks. And we now move to open debate, and I call on Jim Eady to be followed by Hugh Henry. Six minutes or thereby. We have a little time in hand for interventions today. Thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. And it is indeed a pleasure, uh, if not a source of rejoicing, to follow Jackson Carlaw, whose insight and wit uh, was on characteristic display uh, this afternoon. It is self-evident, presiding officer, that alcohol is an integral part of Scottish life. The Scottish beer and pub sector alone accounts for around 5,000 pubs and over 80 breweries across Scotland, supporting over 60,000 jobs and contributing over £1.5 billion to the Scottish economy. And that is before we take into account the white spirits industry and the fact that we are renowned across the globe for our most famous export, whisky. So our relationship with alcohol is economic as well as being part of the social and cultural life of Scotland. However, alcohol misuse is far too prevalent across our society. And despite the Scottish Government publishing its comprehensive framework for action on tackling alcohol abuse in 2009 and introducing measures in recent years to help rebalance our relationship with alcohol, the fact remains that alcohol-related harm remains a major feature of Scottish society. And we see this in the number of alcohol-related hospital admissions in Scotland, which have quadrupled since the 1980s. We see it, as the Cabinet Secretary uh, said, in the number of alcohol-related deaths, which are 1.4 times higher than in the early 1980s. And we see it in the fact, as Jenny Mara highlighted, that as a nation we drink almost one-fifth more than our counterparts in England and Wales. Presiding officer, I mentioned the economic benefits of alcohol, but there is also an economic cost and loss of productivity through sickness. Alcohol misuse is costing Scotland £3.6 billion each year, £900 for every adult in Scotland. And behind these statistics lie many human stories of heavy drinking causing premature death, of alcohol fuelled crime and disorder played out in the accident and emergency departments of our major hospitals every weekend, and of family breakdown. And while in this Parliament we are rightly focused on legislation, on strategies, on policies, we should never lose sight of the fact that this issue is one that affects directly uh, thousands of individuals and communities across Scotland. This week I had the privilege of hosting an exhibition in the members' lobby and only last evening I hosted an event in the Parliament. The theme of the exhibition and the event was to highlight an innovative and important project which afforded people affected by alcohol-related harm the opportunity to document their daily lives, environment and recovery through the use of photo voice, a technique using photographic art and narrative. And this was a collaboration involving the University of Edinburgh, the National Galleries of Scotland, Rowan Alaba and the Serenity Cafe and was supported by NHS Lothian and Scottish Health Action on Alcohol Problems. And I was delighted, presiding officer, that you were able to support that event uh, as well. I would like to welcome to the gallery this afternoon Dr Aisha Holloway and Dr Sarah Rhinas of the University of Edinburgh and I thank them for bringing the voices, stories and pictures of people affected by al alcohol to our parliament. I would like to highlight this afternoon two specific areas in which the Scottish Government is taking steps to positively change our relationship with alcohol, reducing drink driving offences and protecting children and young people from alcohol advertising. Since the introduction of a lower drink driving limit in December last year, the figures released last week by Police Scotland showed that the number of drink driving offences fell by 17% between January and March this year, compared to the same period last year. 
And fewer drink driving offences shows that we in Scotland are leading social and legislative change in the United Kingdom on this matter, which was recently reflected by the Police Federation of England and Wales, who last week issued a call for the legal limit in England and Wales to be in line with Scotland on this matter. However, it is important that we continue to build on these promising early figures for the rest of this year and beyond. Last week's launch of the Scottish Government and Road Safety Scotland's Summer Drink Drive campaign, Don't Spoil Summer, will remind drivers that getting behind the wheel after even one drink is not worth the risk or the potential life-changing uh, consequences. Evidence shows that even one alcoholic drink before driving makes you three times more likely to be involved in a fatal accident, and it is estimated that one in eight deaths on our roads involve drivers who are over the legal limit. And the Director of Road Safety Scotland, Michael MacDonald, reinforced this point when he stated, the best advice is just don't risk it. Continuing to campaign on drink driving and raising public awareness of its dangers and consequences will hopefully serve to further reduce offences and the impact it can have on victims, those behind the wheel and their families. Looking ahead, a culture change in our relationship with alcohol would benefit not only those who are currently affected by alcohol misuse, but also our young people and future generations. There are currently widespread concerns across the health sector over the impact alcohol adverts have on our young people. And although current regulations prevent alcohol advertising around children's programmes, alcohol adverts are still permitted during early evening family viewing, during which many children are watching television. And I was very struck by something which Dr Aisha Holloway said in her presentation at the event in Parliament yesterday evening, when she said, alcohol is visible everywhere. And that is certainly what the research tells us. It should be of concern to all of us that a survey recently published by Alcohol Focus Scotland highlighted the fact that 10 and 11 year olds were more familiar with alcohol brands than leading brands of crisps and ice cream. Now this is nothing short of a scandal and underlines the fact that children and young people are not being adequately enough protected from potential alcohol harm. So I welcome the call by our Minister for Public Health um, to the UK Government to ban alcohol advertising before the 9pm watershed. And I'm pleased as well that the British Medical Association have highlighted the dangers um, of alcohol advertising and have supported this ban. Presiding officer, I believe it is important today to reinforce the message that Scotland is not an anti-alcohol nation, but an anti-alcohol abuse nation. We have a positive relationship in terms of the economic value that alcohol brings to Scotland, the jobs and the industry which it supports, and the enjoyment that moderate, responsible drinking can provide. However, alcohol abuse remains far too prevalent and widespread an issue in Scotland today. We should be encouraged by the legislation, such as minimum unit pricing, the efforts to reduce the drink driving limit have had. Um, in order to improve and rebalance our relationship with alcohol, and we should very much pay tribute to the contribution of alcohol and drug partnerships across the, uh, the country, uh, as well as the work undertaken by the third sector, the NHS and Police Scotland. In, cl in closing, presiding officer, we, need, we can build on the progress that has been made to date. Uh, we should support families and communities affected by alcohol across Scotland, and we can bring about the positive change that we all want to see if we unite as a parliament and a country to bring about that change. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks. We now call on Hugh Henry to be followed by Bob Doris. Well, thank you, President Officer. I was struck by one of the comments which Jim Eady made there that Scotland is not an anti-alcohol nation, it's an anti-alcohol abuse nation. And I think that chimed um, very neatly with the comments made by the Cabinet Secretary, because I think she was right to point out the efforts which have been made to tackle alcohol abuse and to look at some of the successes that we've had in tackling alcohol abuse. But it's also right, as I think she and others um, have done, to put that into a context. Because while we have made progress as a society, our record compared to other countries is still a shocking one. And it, it struck me when I read the briefing from the BMA you know, just how bad some, some of those figures are. That over the last 30 years, uh, not just in Scotland, but UK liver cirrhosis mortality had risen by over 450% across the population. 
and that Scotland had now one of the highest mortality rates in Western Europe. So, as Jackson Carlos said, we cannot be complacent in this, although I think we should retain a sense of realism and perspective. One of the things that, that uh, I think we, we, we sometimes do is we blur the lines of distinction um, when we talk about alcohol and we, we just classify sometimes too easily everybody um, as just being the same. And that's not necessarily always the case because part of this thing about not an anti-alcohol uh, nation, we use terminology in our everyday language and uh, you know, when you hear it in radio and TV, that a good night out is associated with consuming huge amounts of alcohol, and that's just accepted. And we don't distinguish, and, we, and that's what I mean by we blur the lines, we don't distinguish when we talk in those terms between those who abuse alcohol and those who just consume alcohol um, and drinking too much um, in the way that Jackson Carlo had described, just drinking too much on a, on a particular night out. Because it's easy to look at those who've got an alcohol problem. You know, it's very evident, and we see all the associated uh, difficulties, and I want to come back to that. But one of the challenges that we have as a society is dealing with those that, that Jackson Carlo was referring to, those who are not classified as necessarily an alcoholic or someone with an alcohol problem, but whose consumption of alcohol sporadically uh, throughout the year can lead to longer term problems. And actually, I think one of the, the, the danger groups or one of the groups at risk in this is actually people who are better educated and who have access to better incomes. And indeed, and I don't want this to appear just as being sexist, but particularly to young women who now have the economic wherewithal and purchasing power that in years gone by they may not have had. And I see that in my own family and social circles, that you now see young women on specific nights out and occasions drinking far more than my mother's generation would ever have contemplated in, in drinking, certainly. I thank the member for taking intervention. I, I thought about that as well, and I looked at the figures. And funny enough, the, if you look at the 15 years old figures, uh, boys and girls are drinking the same amount. And they've been drinking the same amount of alcohol for many, many years. The only difference is they're not drinking the same alcohol. Girls are more likely to, to drink spirits and alcohol pops than when they were introduced in the 1990s. And the boys are more likely to, to drink cider or, or, or to drink beer. So on consumption of alcohol, there is no great difference between boys and girls. So we'll have to reflect on that. We've got to be very careful when, when, when you talk about both. I'll give you a little extra time, Mr Henry. But actually, that in a sense just proves what I'm saying. Because when I think back, and again I'll use my mother's generation, the alcohol consumption figures weren't the same for male and female. They were much less for female compared to male. And the fact that women are now drinking um, at, at those levels actually brings more women into the risk categories than in the past. Because I can think generationally uh, in my own family that it was the men that were always the ones with the alcohol problems, that had the tendency to abuse the alcohol, that spent more on alcohol. But if we allow ourselves as a society to have young women and young people in general to think that because they've got money in their pocket and they're not an alcoholic, that they can have these uh, episodes where they abuse alcohol, then there are the longer term health risks, the longer term dangers um, associated with that. But actually, I spent more time on that than I intended because I wanted to talk about some of the, the justice and the antisocial behaviour issues associated with alcohol because there is a huge cost um, to our society of excessive alcohol consumption. We see the public disorder issues in many of our towns and, and cities, particularly at weekends. And 
it's not just that, that it's on the streets. We see the damage when they end up in, in hospital and the pressure that it puts on accident uh, and emergency. And we still have an issue that we need to address that that public disorder, that excessive consumption in towns and cities uh, is completely and utterly unacceptable. And each and every one of us has a responsibility to play in that. That's not just one that we should leave um, for the police. And I wanted per particularly to ask either the Cabinet Secretary or whichever Minister um, is, is responding, uh, what information they have on the community uh, payback orders. Because I know that in the past, when Richard Simpson and others were talking about extending the drug treatment and testing orders to alcohol, um, the suggestion was that that wasn't necessary because um, these payback orders would do the same job. And I'd be interested to know just how effective they have been. What are the statistics and how well um, are, are they working? And indeed, whether um, there are any issues surrounding uh, the drug treatment and testing orders that we can learn uh, when we apply that to alcohol. So, in, in conclusion, presiding officer, um, this is a multifaceted problem that, 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 that we have. Um, it's not one merely for our doctors and nurses. It's not one for our police officers. Uh, it's certainly, as Jackson Carlow and others have said, it's a matter of education, and we all have a role to, 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 to play there. But equally, um, close, but equally, presiding officer, um, we shouldn't treat lightly the consequences, not just of binge drinking, but the consequences of continued and constant drinking, uh, albeit within safe levels. And I think some of the evidence shows that that can have significant long-term damage as well. Thank you. Many thanks. Now call on Bob Doris to be followed by Gil Patterson. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Uh, I believe the title of this debate is central to the issue of tackling alcohol abuse, and that is Scotland's relationship with alcohol. Many people are reluctant to discuss the relationship with alcohol at all, perhaps worried that if they admit they are perhaps drinking too much, they will be labelled as an alcoholic. And I use that language quite deliberately. Labelled, it comes. Alcoholism still comes with a stigma. Calling someone an alky or a jakey. If it was other forms of drug abuse, it would be a junkie. We have to move away from that type of unhelpful and stigmatising language. Clearly, it's unhelpful, and it means those who do have significant, significant problems are also far less likely to come forward uh, to have them uh, supported in, in, in dealing with them. Um, but our relationship with alcohol is also contradictory. Perhaps best captured in the, the go on, have a drink, no, I'm off it sketch from chewing the fat. And I say that because we stigmatise those who have significant problems with alcohol. And then we're suspicious of those that don't partake of a drink just to be social, of course, you understand. And I think that contradiction is a key part of the debate in Scotland's relationship with alcohol, not our addiction to, but our relationship with alcohol. And it's in that context I want to look at one or two uh, themes uh, this afternoon. Uh, we've heard already about alcohol brief interventions, and I think that should be viewed in, in this strategy as well. So some of the numbers around that, 477,000 uh, alcohol brief interventions exceeding targets set by the government, and it has, and it has been successful. So targeted at over 16s, who are suspected to be drinking at hazardous and harmful levels, hoping that they will moderate their intake. And yes, the evidence does show they will, they will reduce their intake for a short time at least. And that does give health benefits, even if they only reduce their intake for that short time. And it will have long-term benefits. But of course we have to do better at those brief interventions having a short-term benefit and how we get that connectivity to changing someone's relationship with, uh, with alcohol in the, the longer term. And that does come down to education. And I think um, we lump it all saying, let's do more in schools. I think it's about education in the family. I think it's about education in the workplace. I think it's about education uh, before you go to your football match and after you come back. 
or education when you go to a family wedding reception. It's about discussing openly and honestly a relationship with alcohol. And yes, we should do it in schools, but it can't just be put at schools. We've all got our own personal and community responsibilities in relation to that. I'd like to have a mention to a group who does a wonderful job in terms of community responsibilities. And it's a while since I've done this now, but um, I did walk a, a Friday night in the streets of Glasgow with the street pastors. And what an amazing and wonderful job they did, particularly, I have to say, helping vulnerable young women in the city centre. Not to lecture them in their alcohol intake, just to be there. Just to be there to offer a pair of flip-flops rather than high heels if they were too much to drink. Not to stop them to going on to the next bar if they're too much to drink, but just to let them know, you know, if they needed a wee hand getting a taxi home or a wee half hour out, they were there. You know, just a bit of a uh, friendship. And I just want to put on record the amazing, amazing job that, that I saw the street pastors do when I was out, out with them. Um, we have made some, some progress. I want to just mention one or two of the statistics around some of the progress we've made. Uh, so alcohol-related hospital discharge rates have reduced by 20% since 2007, but they're still 3.4 times higher than in 1981-1982. And unlike Jackson Carlow, I won't relate that to uh, the then Conservative government, but we have to look at the, the point I'm raising here is we have to look at over a significantly long period of time so we can, we can even out short-term but non-enduring impacts in relation to the success we make. Um, also, alcohol-related mortality has fallen by 35% since its peak in 2003. And actually, I won't list through a, a number of successes we've had, because I think we, we admit that as, as, as welcoming as those successes are, they have to be long-term and they have to be enduring. I'll tell you one that I think will be long-term and enduring, and that was actually the multi-pack ban for, 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 for buying... Uh, alcohol and the quantity discount ban uh, found that there was a 2.6 per cent decrease in sales of that type in alcohol more generally and we were able to quality assure that because what we did is we compared similar areas in England to Scotland who didn't implement that ban and when you compare it there's still a 2.6 per cent uh, drop in intake so I think access to alcohol alcohol being seen as a cheap option bargain which I'm guilty of if I'm in the supermarket and I see a nice bottle of wine, I go, oh, that's down to a fiver. I'll have that. If it's nine quid, I won't do that. And I have to say, and I won't give details because we're not allowed to, presiding officer, but um, we looked in detail about price sensitivity across all income groups in relation to minimum pricing and affordability. And that information is on the record without me repeating it here this afternoon. Um, I just want to say one thing in, in concluding. And that is yesterday in this chamber, I asked Michael Matheson, the Justice Secretary, if he would consider using cashback monies to tackle health inequalities from 2017. He said he would give that significant consideration following my intervention. And when you look at health inequalities and you look at the effect of alcohol on communities, I can't think of a better use of the money. And I hope Scottish Government policy might just develop in that area, presiding officer. Many thanks. I now call on Gil Patterson to be followed by Jane Baxter. Many thanks, Presiding Officer. As a former member of the Health and Sports Committee, I am very pleased to participate in this debate. Having sat on the committee for a number of years, the issue of tackling Scotland's relationship with alcohol was one that I was heavily engaged in. And I, although I am no longer a member of the committee, it is an issue that re remains very much on my own agenda. I come to this debate as someone who does not actually drink alcohol, and I have been a non-drinker my whole life. Well, that is not actually quite true. I once got drunk in Greece after sampling a local drink called Ritzina. Yes, it was certainly a very nice drink. However, I failed to heed the warnings from my friends that it was a very potent triple. But I was drinking to taste, not for the effect and not being accustomed to alcohol, my constitu constitution couldn't handle the effects. Would I drink Ritzina again? Should I return to Greece? Well, yes. I'm sure I would, as I love Greece. I love the people, but I'll take Ritzina very, very cautiously in future. So I have no hang-ups with people who enjoy a drink. In fact, I believe what my mother taught me long ago, that what, uh, and that is, I, a little of but what you fancy does you good. So drink in moderation is my advice. Enjoy it 
and I believe that a little alcohol can actually be beneficial to you. But be aware of the danger of excessive drinking. The excess of what I call the Scottish disease. From looking at the stats, it's clear when it comes to the misuse and overuse of alcohol that there are significant problems that ur urgently need tackled. If it's not something we can, that we want to address for ourselves, surely we have a responsibility to sort it out for our young people. We need, we need to make the step change right now for them to appreciate that not taking up the habit is much easier than giving up the habit. I have, or should I say, had some very close friends, some of whom had enormous talents, particularly in the arts, but who could not function without, without drinking alcohol right up until they could not function in the art world at all due to their alliance which ultimately led to their graves. What a loss and what tragedy, not only for they themselves, but for their families and for society as a whole. I'm sure I'm not alone in this chamber of experiencing uh, such tragic circumstances. Now, I recognise that kicking a habit is not easy, whether it's drugs, alcohol, smoking, gambling, or even food. If it was that easy, the highly talent, talented and intelligent people that, who I knew would not have succumbed to the addiction in the first place. On the other hand, with good support, if accepted, and that's important, if accepted by those who need it, combined with determination, then things can surely turn for the best. When I was very young, my father was, extremely, was a, a, an extremely heavy drinker, just like so many of his generation. He was certainly a great man without the drink, but Mr. Hyde with it. He woke up one day and decided not, not uh, to stop drinking. Yes, he, he would still certainly have an odd beer, but it would only be one, and he never sunk back to his earlier uh, excesses. Now, the benefits to him as an individual were immense. His appearance, his mood, and his manner changed. He was a new man. But the benefits for my family, and particularly my mother, were life-changing. We were a happy family, not wealthy, but what we, what we had was then well spent. This, this story is one that a number of people can relate to, but sadly too many cannot as they have never experienced the positive change that could happen. The stats for Scotland, when compared to nearly every developed country in the world, sadly back the situation up. And no one can argue that change is not needed. Scotland consumes huge levels of alcohol. In 2010, recorded consumption was twice the world average and well above the, the, the European regional average. This is having a detrimental impact on the health of our people. Indeed, Scotland's overall death rate from liver cirrhosis in 2010 was around 40% higher than the EU average. So I'm really pleased that the Scottish Government has not sat by, but has been aggressively engaged in tackling this problem head on. Policies such as a ban on quantity discounts and off sales that encourage customers to buy more than they might have done, plus the implementation of restrictions on where materials promoting alcohol may be displayed are having a positive uh, impact. But more must be done, and the Scottish Government's framework for action outlines this in detail. Presiding officer, urgent change is required if we are to break our country's relationship with alcohol, and I commend the motion to the Parliament and to the Labour uh, Amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Jane Baxter to be followed by Christian Alla. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scotland's problems with alcohol are deep-rooted. The statistics demonstrate this, and I imagine, and we've heard today, the lived experiences of everyone contributing to this debate show that too. But that does not mean that we can simply shrug our shoulders and accept it. 
So I am pleased that there is cross-party support for tackling Scotland's alcohol problem. The British Medical Association has described Britain's relationship with alcohol as an epidemic. The BMA has outlined the scale of the problem in Scotland. Alcohol is related to more than 60 types of disease, disability and injury. More than a million people in Scotland are drinking hazardously or harmfully. And over the last 30 years, UK liver cirrhosis mortality has risen over 450% across the population. And actually, when I saw that figure, as I was sitting waiting to speak, I thought, can that be right? And I've checked it in the papers, and it is right. That's a stunning figure, 450%. The BMA further notes that in recent years, the number of alcohol-related hospital admissions has fallen, although they remain higher than in the rest of the UK and Europe. But they also note that alcohol-related hospital admissions are approximately six to seven times higher for patients living in the most deprived areas compared to those living in the least deprived areas. And when faced with this, there's often a rush to create new offences and new regulations. When we see a problem, we understandably want to try to tackle it. But before looking to manufacture new rules, we should always make sure that the current ones are enforced. As Francis Ennis, an expert on licensing law at the respected law firm Pinsent Masons, has explained, one of the main problems with the, with the Scottish licensing system is not the lack of appropriate legislation. If the vast majority of existing legislation was properly funded and implemented, then there would be little need for additional provisions. But alcohol misuse is not something that can simply be corrected by new statutes or improved enforcement. It's often a function of the shocking absence of life chances for many people. It's no accident that there is a relationship between alcohol misuse and poverty. And it's critical that we change our approach to one of early intervention, health awareness and community-based support. But all of that costs money. My colleague Richard Simpson raised earlier the government's failure to act on having a social responsibility levy and I confess that sounds like a good idea to me, and it could be a way to enable the many groups rightly praised in the motion to take more action on alcohol-related problems in Scotland. Moreover, Dr Richard Simpson's bill before this Parliament contains many common-sense provisions. Increasing the amount of time that a statutory notice for a new alcohol licence is made public is a sensible provision. The same can be said for imposing a statutory duty on the Scottish Government to update and report on their alcohol strategy. The idea at the heart of the bill, namely that there be drinking banning orders taking in GPs and other professionals to help those who have a problem with alcohol, is a sort of bold measure that we need to seriously tackle our alcohol problem. It is a multi-sectoral approach with criminal justice professionals, social workers and the medical profession working together, and that will yield the best results. The Fife Alcohol Fixed Penalty Diversion Scheme, which has been running as part of the Fife Alcohol Support Service based in Kirkcaldy, started as a pilot scheme in 2011, and Dr Simpson's bill takes much from this. I hope that the bill is given proper consideration by this Parliament. In Fife, there has been some great work aimed at tackling alcohol misuse. For both drug and alcohol use, there has been £250,000 of funding from Fife Council for residential rehabilitation. Whilst that's not a new concept, it is new money that was secured when my colleague Alec Rowley was council leader. It's a relatively small project with 16 people benefiting last year, nine of whom had difficulties with alcohol. However, these are people who would otherwise not have had the opportunity to get the comprehensive and intensive access to rehab afforded by this investment. It also recognises that many people who abuse alcohol also abuse other substances. It is a more holistic approach than many others. The Scottish Drugs Forum Addiction Working Worker Training Programme, which the Alcohol and Drug Partnership and Fife Council are jointly fund in Fife, is an initiative open to people recovering from alcohol or drug problems, and it allows them to train for a career in social care, with particular emphasis on substance misuse services. It provides people with real workplace-based training and an opportunity to achieve SVQ Level 2 in social care. It launched over a decade ago, and is aimed at helping former drug and alcohol users prepare for employment in social care through in-work placements and formal learning. AWTP is the first project in Scotland to offer former drug and alcohol users the opportunity to gain supported work experience and a qualification while receiving a wage for the duration of the course. And it develops a multi-agency approach to employability for former substance users. These schemes are grounded in their communities and they strike the correct balance between supporting those who misuse alcohol and ensuring that the community is protected from the negative consequences of such misuse 
I believe that they should be looked at closely by the Scottish Government. I agree with the Alcohol Focus Scotland that creating health promoting communities where citizens play an active role through ensuring the licensing system supports meaningful community involvement and is accountable and responsive to the community it serves. This is not an easy task. It will necessitate cultural changes across Scotland, in families, schools, colleges, universities and beyond. This Parliament can only do so much to encourage people to make the necessary changes. We must refocus our efforts to tackle Scotland's problematic relationship with alcohol. The work that has been done in Fife and across Scotland, conducted largely by local authorities, charities and voluntary organisations, is beginning to show results. We must work collaboratively with them and the public themselves to take the steps needed to sort out Scotland's relationship with alcohol. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Christian Allard to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you, President Officer. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government to bring that debate today. I, that motion talks about Scotland's relationship with alcohol. I think it's a lot, much more than this. Uh, as somebody who came in this country 30 years ago, I was shocked when I came here. I was shocked to see that relationship that Scotland has with alcohol. We can't find it anywhere in other countries. We have this attitude of alcohol, which is absolutely different than in any other countries, believe you me. And we talked about uh, uh, countries who are producing alcohol. France is one of the countries who produce a lot of alcohol. But yet again, we're not drinking in France the same way that we are drinking here in Scotland. So that's the first point which is very important. That relationship that Scotland has with alcohol is very, very different from any kind of relationship. Now, I would like to take it a bit further because we talked about the relationship about a Scotland relationship with alcohol for many, many years. I want to talk about what we can do as, as individuals, what we can do about our relationship with people who have a problem with alcohol. And those people are among us. Those people are us. Sometimes it's us. Sometimes it's us who have the problem with alcohol. One night, one week, at any time, when we were young, when we were older, when we feel a little bit isolated. So we are all at risk. It's not a fact to, to, to thinking, and I know a lot of my colleagues talk about education. But we know this week, if more than any week, a reminder that politicians, with all the knowledge, with all the education, with all the understanding, can still be caught in it. And God, a lot of them are caught in it. You know, if you go down to Westminster and here, even in this parliament, we're caught in it. So it's not only about policies, and we are doing great policies, and we've got them there. But it's not resp responsibility only of the government, or some uh, said the responsibility of people who drink, who abuse alcohol, who don't drink with moderation. I don't like that tone, not drinking with moderation. You know, for a lot of people, in France, in Scotland, all over the world, it's not such a thing than drinking with moderation. Some people cannot drink alcohol at all. So we can blame them for the disturbance we give, we can blame them for, for, for the money we, we are spending on the NHS, or we can see what we can do ourselves, what we can do as individuals. And we have to revert into this. It's a society problem. We've got a government who's doing fantastic things, we introduce a lot of things. But as a society, as individuals, we need to change our attitude. Not only our attitude with alcohol, but our attitude with people who've got an alcohol problem. We can't let it go. We are far too often the alcohol bodies, the drinking bodies, the one who facilitate, who help somebody else. Or sometimes, it's the contrary, as I said. We are the one who ended up in a bad state, who ended up in peril because of, of the alcohol we drink, because we had buddies around us who thought it, it, it was a good idea. So I don't want to target women as well, because we talked about women. And by all means, what did we expect? Of course, equality is coming. Of course, women 
we, we, we're having the same opportunity at work, the same opportunity money-wise as well. Everybody has got a lot more money in their pocket. Of course, it's going to affect both gender. And I'm not sure yet if women is worse for women than for men, because men are still drinking a lot, apart from the fact that women are, have, have decided to go more, especially young women, into alcohol pops, into, into spirits as well. So I really wanted to start with it. What I would like to talk about is drink driving as well. I was in the Justice Committee when we introduced the drink driving limit. And that drink driving limit, you know, of course we had to, I have no understanding why a country like ours ended up with a drink driving limit which was uh, higher than it was in other countries who didn't have the same problem with alcohol. Oh, one of the reasons was because it's reserved to Westminster, and we managed to get that with uh, some, uh, some very much constructive negotiation with Westminster. And I will encourage the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister, uh, when closing, to keep on that construction dialogue with Westminster to, to, uh, uh, to address all the issues that we haven't got the, the, the problem with. But I'm delighted that the changes it did in Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire and Moray, in the northeast, the, the, the region I represent, we had a fell by more than 20 23% of people caught on the, uh, driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol. And that makes a big difference. But the biggest difference in all this is that people stop drinking during the week. And that is a fantastic changing of attitude. In fact, this legislation that we brought forward, which was a drink driving, I call it more a drink, li uh, a drink living, meaning that we changed the way we lived because we know it was very important to go and drive every morning to work. We decided that we have to change the way we live. So if we can find other ideas like this to change our attitude to alcohol, not only the people who have that problem with alcohol, because we all have to a certain extent, even the people who don't drink, you know, we, we need to have that understanding that a part of the population will have a problem with alcohol. Uh, what I would like to talk about, uh, of, of course, as well, it's uh, the idea that uh, uh, drink, uh, drink, dri uh, dri drink driving living, uh, drink drive uh, limit, uh, it's important to have it as well for others than uh, uh, um, drivers of cars. And I did suggest that we could have asking Westminster to have lorry drivers and bus drivers as well, uh, having a lower limit than we have just now. But we need to, to ask Westminster. So that, that, that would be a point which is important as well. And to a certain extent, England and Wales are drinking a lot less than we are, especially the, the young people. Even if our young people are, are, are drinking better than they used to do, they're still behind uh, regarding the, the, the consumption of alcohol by young people in Wales and, and, and in England. As a policy in Wales, and again, the Federation of Police in England and Wales has called for the legal limit in England and Wales to be in line with Scotland. So that's good news. But we are groundbreaking and we are finding a way to, to, to help this. But businesses have a responsibility. Uh, I, in February last year, I, uh, this year, I was delighted to see the Albert Hotel in Peterhead, Aberdeenshire, who has begun to stock an extensive range of alcohol-free beers and wine. And that may bring me back to what we can do. I was surprised last night. I was at that event from Jimmy Lee with uh, the, the people uh, who, who worked fantastically well and, and were there. And I, I would suggest that you should go to see that photo exhibition. You can go to Serenity, the little cafe, uh, which is uh, at Jackson and Try. It's just opposite the SNP headquarters, if you want to know what it is. And that's a, a fantastic work that, 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 that we have done. But when we finished that, uh, that, uh, that event last night, I came down and I was next to the bar of the, of, the, of the parliament, and there were an advertisement for a beverage called Hihan, which is the new alcohol free lager, which is a fantastic name if, if you think about it. But what really annoyed me, that despite that sign which was right in front of the bar, when I had finished to work late at night and I came down, and I asked uh, the, the people behind the bar, how many did you sell, when did you start? And they started two days ago to sell this fantastic he Hambi. I'll let you guess how many of this uh, 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 free, uh, free, alcohol-free lager was drunk. he Hambi. He <laughs> and this is the problem. All we can do, or the regulation we can have, and the Scottish government are doing fantastic, if we don't do anything about it as individual, the result will be he Hambi. <laughs>
Thank you very much. I now call Sandra White to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And, uh, I see Jackson Carlo uh, sort of shaking his head, and it's, uh, it's called hee-haw, which means there's hee-haw alcohol. And so I thought I'd just explain that. I saw you sort of shaking your head, Jackson, uh, in that respect. And I must admit, it uh, certainly was offered to me, but I don't drink lager, so... Whether it was he or not, I, I didn't accept it. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, presiding officer, and can I thank the members uh, for their contributions? I think they've all been excellent, and they've covered a great many areas from alcohol intervention by NHS Scotland, record investment in tackling alcohol misuse, and the setting up of alcohol and drug partnerships. Uh, however, as mentioned by a number of members, uh, the average of 20 alcohol-related deaths a week, 700 alcohol-related hospital uh, admissions each week. It really is totally uh, unacceptable, and it shows that we still have a very long way to go. Uh, I realise, I'm sure we all realise, that this is not a quick fix solution. It will take a long time, and uh, really it's a change of culture that we have in this country, unfortunately, in our relationship with alcohol. And uh, I do uh, you know, agree with you, Henry, in one of the points he makes in regarding young women. Uh, certainly, living in the city centre of Glasgow, unfortunately, I do see a lot more young women uh, you know, partaking of maybe more alcohol than they would partake. But also one of the issues I agree with with you, Henry, is that we're talking about alcohol abuse and alcoholics. But there are people who have long-term drink problems who are not deemed as alcoholics and have to go through their life in that respect. And obviously that has a, an impact not just on the economy, but on their work, but on their families as well. And uh, they basically just um, go through their lives with a, a terrible problem. I, I do welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement of the social marketing campaign aimed at to educating parents. And I would echo your comments, Cabinet Secretary, in regards to advertising, particularly uh, to young people and aimed at young people, and would urge the Westminster Government to devolve broadcasting to the Scottish Parliament. And uh, I do thank uh, Jenny Mara when she mentioned the fact that the SNP success in Westminster returning 56 MPs would, I hope, deliver this to the Scottish Parliament. Uh, we also you know, have to look at uh, issues, I think Jackson Carlow raised this, about the, how cheap alcohol is now uh, compared to many years ago. It's far too cheap. Uh, you know, young people will go into supermarkets, which is one of the ones I think that minimum pricing has to look at. Young people will go into supermarkets, as are other people, but uh, what I hear from... Um, you know, pubs and clubs, is that uh, young people will take of the cheaper drink from supermarkets before they actually go into the pubs and the clubs. And you can see by the figures that uh, they can... Yes, take an intervention. Jenny Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Thank the member for giving way. If I can just clarify, I don't, I don't think her reflection of the point I made was completely accurate. I think what I was saying was the new group of representatives at Westminster would be able to to lobby the government there for changes in advertising and broadcasting. It's my belief, I'm sure it's hers too, that perhaps changes in alcohol um, advertising through broadcasting would benefit people across the United Kingdom and not just in Scotland. Sandra um, White. I absolutely no, I agree with Jenny Mara. I think I took on board what you said. It's just a slight interpretation of it, but absolutely. And what I did mention was the fact that we 56 uh, you know, more than ever had before will make a big difference and they're making a difference just now. But I do agree, it's not just in Scotland, it's throughout the UK, but unfortunately we can't uh, put that through, uh, you know, our TV screens as well. But as I said before about the cheapness of alcohol, I think that's something we do need to look at. And as we mentioned before, minimum pricing uh, has to be looked at also. But I do want to concentrate more on the human aspect and the human cost of you know, alcohol abuse, whether it's being an alcoholic or a long-term heavy drinker, and the human cost to that. Now, Jim Media had the excellent event last night. I wasn't able to go there, but I went to the stall and uh, see the people here in the, in the gallery. The Serenity Cafe does a fantastic amount of work. Lots and lots of that going throughout the constituencies as well. Everyone's constituency, in my own constituency, we have party Healthy Living centre which uh, runs nights for people without alcohol and I just want to give you an example how welcome uh, that is they run film nights they run music nights and club nights and a lady that was at one of them said to me that um, she had not been out with her partner or husband for many many years because they couldn't go out to a pub 
simply because her husband had a, a drink problem and for once they were actually able to go to a club night and enjoy the music there. So that's something really, really positive that came out of that uh, in that respect. Another area where I think we have to look at, and I know Serenity Cafe has done some work in this, as had uh, addiction in my own area, St Vincent Crescent, when I spoke to people there. Uh, one gentleman, obviously won't name the people that are there, but one gentleman who did have a drink problem and basically was able to come off uh, the, the, the alcohol, but stayed in the same environment. And previous to that, he had lots and lots of friends who obviously liked to drink and they would go to each other's houses. Now, he had to let them in his house or he didn't have his friends. And what he did uh, one particular night when they came around was lock himself in the bathroom because simply because if he, he didn't, he'd have succumbed to the alcohol again. So I think we've got to look at that in an aspect of, you know, social care, health care as well, where if someone does manage to get off the alcohol addiction, if they're kept in the same environment with the same people, it's very, very difficult for them to get away from that. So I think it's something that um, perhaps everyone has experienced in regards to their constituents. Uh, another issue, uh, a lady who unfortunately had um, an alcohol problem uh, ended up um, not very well at all now. Very, very successful businesswoman, lost her house, lost her business, lost her family, uh, grandchildren as well. So I think we've all got these aspects of our constituents and it's a terrible, terrible issue, alcohol, uh, and I think it's something that we do need to take seriously. This debate, I think, has you know, mentioned a number of things, but the human cost of alcohol, not just to the economy and the facts and figures that are going about here, uh, for them, the people who are affected by alcohol addiction and their family is absolutely tremendous and it's something we do have to tackle and it is the cultural aspect of, you know, here in Scotland, something we need to look at. And education is somewhere we have to put forward from young to old. But education is certainly something, and perhaps, as has been mentioned before, an advertising campaign to show the harms of alcohol and what effect it can have on families. Uh, I thank everyone very much for their contributions, and I thank the government for bringing this forward, and I look forward to moving on and, uh, you know, releasing some of the, 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 you know, the, the negative aspects of the cultural love affair that Scotland does have with alcohol. Thank you very much, President Officer. Many thanks. I now call Anne McTaggart to be followed by Dave Thompson. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to have the opportunity to contribute to this debate as alcohol is an ongoing matter which is of great concern to many of all our constituents. Alcohol misuse is its consequence for health and community safety remains a significant challenge, not only in Scotland, but throughout the UK. We all know how important relationships are. They are central to our lives and are so very important to our well-being. And we have to look at our country's relationship with alcohol, and I'm sure we can all very much agree that it is a relationship which is severely harming health and well-being, affecting our communities and undermining our potential as a nation of individuals. The people of Scotland have the ability and ambition to lead in plenty aspects of global affairs, but the current alcohol statistics in Scotland leave us nothing to be proud of. The levels of alcohol consumption in Scotland have reduced since 2009. However, the level of alcohol sales remains higher than they were in 1994. Scotland's consumption of alcohol was twice the world's average in 2010 and well above the European regional average. The alcohol-related hospital admissions in Scotland are four times higher than they were in the the early 1980s. That is on average 700 hospital admissions as well as 20 deaths which are directly related to alcohol each year. Young people are under a lot of pressure to start drinking at a young age. Alcohol today is so affordable, available and heavily marketed. As a result, young people are growing up in a pro-alcohol society where drinking is seen as the norm and therefore we should begin by denormalising alcohol for children and teenagers. Experimenting with alcohol is a phase which many go through, but the age which young people, which young Scottish people start 
experimenting is younger than our European partners, as well as much more frequent. Presiding officer, as a mother of three children, two of which are teenagers, I cautionly welcome the data from the Scottish Adolescent Lifestyle Substance Use Survey, which reports a substantial reduction in alcohol consumption among young people since 2010. The survey shows that 19% of 15-year-olds reported that they had drank alcohol in the last week, which is down from 34%, which was in 2010, and 4% of 13-year-olds, which was down from 44% in 2010. This is still a staggering and worrying statistic, which needs to be addressed so that we can move forward without alcohol being a huge component of young people's lives in Scotland. It is our underlying duty to help anyone who has an issue with alcohol, but we need to implement tougher measures as well as more education on the issues to our young people so that we can break the cycle at a young age, as that's where the problems start. Teenage drinking can have both immediate and long-term health problems, with most of the admissions of teenagers into hospital resulting from alcohol consumption. While that is the immediate impact, heavy regular drinking in younger years leads to the development of chronic diseases such as liver cirrhosis. This is something which has to change as if we do not make substantial attempts at condoning this behaviour, we will be left with a chronically ill young adult population. The earlier teenagers are exposed to alcohol, the more likely they are to face challenges in later years. Therefore, we need to address the problem at the root and provide more support and more education in schools on the harmful effect, side effects of alcohol consumption. For a long time, there have also been concerns about the possible effects on children's attitudes towards alcohol that exposure to alcohol advertising might have. I believe, and alongside the, the BMA, we should restrict the advertising of alcohol drinks. In particular, alcohol advertising should be banned near places used by children, such as schools, and at events targeted at children in order to reduce that exposure. In conclusion, presiding officer, alcohol consumption in Scotland cannot go on at the current rate. The strain which alcohol puts on public services is costly and time-consuming. And if we could work together to safeguard our population from alcohol, then we would have fewer alcohol-related challenges. There are members across all political parties determined to tackle Scotland's drink problem. However, in order to be successful, a shift in Scotland's culture is essential and we need to contribute to delivering that change right away. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Dave Thompson, who will be followed by Mary Fee. Well, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Scotland's relationship with uh, alcohol is uh, as well known an issue as it is a complex one. In Scotland, we do drink far more than we did a, a generation ago, and alcohol consumption is almost a fifth higher than the rest of the UK. Now, I accept that drinking in moderation can have beneficial effects for some people. However, heavy drinking places a burden on society. It doesn't just damage health and cause premature death, but also contributes to crime and disorder. Binge drinking, particularly among youngsters aged between 18 and 30 on a Friday and Saturday night, remains a problem. And there's an economic cost uh, to our unhealthy relationship with alcohol, including a loss of productivity through sickness. Alcohol misuse is costing Scotland £3.6 billion each year. To put that in perspective, that is £900 for every adult in our country. I do, however, recognise the progress we have made on tackling alcohol misuse in Scotland and the impact of the Scottish Government's comprehensive 2009 strategy, Changing Scotland's Relationship with Alcohol, a Framework for Action. 
The framework contains a range of measures, including education support for families and communities and preventative public health measures, together with minimum unit pricing and other regulatory measures on issues such as irresponsible promotion of alcohol. And it's not all bad where our youngsters are concerned. The Scottish Adolescent Lifestyle Substance Use Survey 2013 informs us that 13 to 15 year olds are consuming less alcohol on a weekly basis compared to 2010 and are at their lowest since records began in 1990. Many young people living with someone with an alcohol problem take on additional caring responsibilities within the family unit which can be detrimental to their life opportunities and this is often underreported or undisclosed to those outside of the home. In order to engage with young people, the Scottish families affected by alcohol and drugs group have adopted a range of consultative measures involving workshops and prevalence studies, which involve attempting to challenge social stigma as a barrier to accessing support, changing social attitudes towards drinking, supporting those living in remote and rural communities and assisting with training and resources. As mentioned by other members, uh, we could not have a debate on Scotland's relationship with alcohol without mentioning the Alcohol Minimum Pricing Scotland Act 2012, which was passed unopposed by this Parliament in June 2012. It's hoped that the government framework, which is being developed in relation to alcohol, will breed the cultural changes that are required to positively affect Scotland's relationship with alcohol. Other measures have shown that this can be done, and the lowering of the drink driving limit, which has already been mentioned in December last year, a campaign which I was heavily involved in, has led to many people leaving their cars at home when they go out, or not drinking alcohol if they do take the car. Following the introduction of the new law, figures from Police Scotland showed that the number of motorists caught drink driving in Scotland during the first uh, festive period dropped by almost a third in the previous year. And I uh, hope that Jackson Carlo's earlier comments in relation to this are indeed uh, uh, incorrect. As the motion states, it is wholly unacceptable that there is an average of 20 alcohol-related deaths and 700 alcohol-related hospital admissions each week in Scotland. And further, uh, Scotland now has one of the highest cirrhosis mortality rates in Western Europe and is ranked eighth in the world for alcohol consumption <coughs> per head of population. We all have a role to play in tackling this scourge and we must continue the good work and the progress that has already been made. I'm teetotal. Uh, I haven't drunk alcohol for nearly 15 years. Uh, I was born and brought up in a place called Lossiemouth, a fishing town, many very heavy drinking fishermen in that town, many very religious fishermen who didn't drink <coughs> at all. In my early 20s, I moved to Stornoway, and uh, you'll all have heard about the, the Gaelic mod, which is also known as the Whiskey Olympics. And uh, I started drinking when I was uh, at a young age, and uh, over many years I developed from pints of beer to whiskey and, and so on. And I was probably a pretty typical uh, young man um, in the Highlands who tended to go out on a Friday night, and you would drink Friday night, you would drink Saturday, you often wouldn't drink on a Sunday, but by the time Monday came, quite often you would have a bit of a, a hangover, and you wouldn't really be... 100%. Drink is something that creeps up on people. It's an illness. It's something that very gradually takes a hold of people. And sometimes uh, many of us have to look at our lives and look at what we're doing and think, is this something I want to carry on doing? I took the decision. I was helped greatly um, after I became a Christian. And I would say without hesitation, that if it wasn't for, for God, I probably would have still been drinking. Uh, it was the best thing I ever did. It has changed my life. I had a very successful career. I was doing everything very, very well. But, you know, at the weekends, just 
drinking more than was good for me and more than, than was good for the people around about me. So this is something that I feel very passionately about. We have to help people who have an alcohol problem. Our society at the moment doesn't help people. Young people who start drinking and who go on to the flavoured alcoholic drinks, the alcohol pops and all these other things that are available these days, it draws them in far too quickly. It's like drinking lemonade. When I started drinking, you had to get used to the taste of the gin, rum, vodka, whiskey, or, or beer, or, or, or lager. So anything we can do uh, to improve this situation has to be good. We'll need many different measures in order to deal with this problem. And I'm very pleased that this chamber this afternoon is going to come together and vote uh, as one in relation to this motion and, and amendment to help us to tackle this scourge of alcohol. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Mary Fee to be followed by James Dornan. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate today. And I've listened with great interest to the contributors from across the Chamber this afternoon. And I want to focus most of my contribution on the personal impact of alcohol dependency and misuse. And, Presiding Officer, Scotland is currently ranked eighth in the world for alcohol consumption per head of population. And according to the British Medical Association, more than one million people in Scotland drink hazardously or harmfully. Scotland now has one of the highest cirrhosis mortality rates in Western Europe. And indeed, every 15 minutes, someone in Scotland is hospitalised with an alcohol-related illness, which means that nine people have been hospitalised with an alcohol-related illness during this debate. Nine people are now in hospital because of alcohol this afternoon alone. Scotland has a problem with alcohol. It cannot be denied, and it must be tackled. With the cost of binge drinking estimated to be £4.9 billion across the UK and an average cost of £114 per A&E visit, we must direct additional resources towards education and prevention. And the results of the Scottish Social Attitudes Survey in 2013 reveal just how uninformed many people in Scotland still are concerning the amount of alcohol they are consuming. One third of those questioned didn't know what the daily guideline for alcohol consumption was for men and women. And a further quarter got the daily guideline wrong. And we must ensure that people are fully informed and educated on the effects and dangers of excessive alcohol consumption. Indeed, one danger which has long been identified is the link between alcohol and crime. And in 2012, the Scottish Consortium for Crime and Criminal Justice found that 62% of violent crime victims stated their attackers were under the influence of alcohol. And furthermore, half of Scottish prisoners state they were drunk at the time of committing their offence. And offenders are a particular concern as they are three times more likely than the general Scottish population to have an alcohol problem. And this is an issue which must be tackled. And we must do all we can to ensure that offenders do not e end up with an alcohol dependency after their release from prison. And tackling alcohol dependency is crucial, not only because it affects the individual, but because it also affects their family and friends. We have to take a more inclusive approach to helping individuals who suffer from alcohol abuse. And research by Scottish families affected by alcohol and drugs outlines the many benefits of involving families in their relatives' treatment and recovery. Firstly, it increases the likelihood that an individual will enter treatment and remain in treatment longer. Secondly, it increases the likelihood that the individual receiving treatment will receive their goals, both during and after rehabilitation. And finally, it improves the general well-being of family members by creating an environment where an individual in recovery is less likely to return to alcohol dependency. 
and it is imperative that we take the appropriate action to ensure that family members are given the correct level of support in their own right to help with a relative's addiction. Average weekly consumption of harmful drinkers is considerably higher in Scotland's lowest income communities compared with the rest of the country, and it is in our deprived communities where most harm is experienced. And many across the Chamber will know that I spent 20 years working in retail. And it was in retail that I witnessed the struggles of alcohol, addiction and misuse faced by many customers on a daily basis. For example, if a customer didn't have enough money to pay for basic food items, it was a frequent occurrence that they would return the essential food items before they would return cans of lager, lager, cider or their bottle of vodka. On a daily basis, people were picking alcohol over essential food. And we all know the phrase, heating or eating, but for many in society, it's eating or drinking. We regularly also saw pe people waiting for the alcohol aisle to open in the morning so they could purchase their first drink of the day. And this serves as a reminder that every day, people in every community, the length and breadth of this country, face struggles with alcohol dependency. And that's why it's crucial we must change the way we view alcohol and we must face up to the size of the challenge this is. And the final issue I'd like to raise is the important issue of abuse faced by retail staff. And again, from my time working in retail, I have first-hand experience of the kinds of abuse frontline workers receive on a daily basis from customers with alcohol problems. And across the UK, there are 2.7 million retail workers who regularly deal with abuse and violence. And while I accept that not all of it is caused by alcohol, the vast majority of violence and abuse in shops is caused by alcohol. Shop workers deal with abuse, threats, harassment and violence for simply upholding the law and refusing to sell alcohol to people who are already intoxicated. My union, USDA, has led on this issue with the Freedom from Fear campaign, which seeks to prevent violence, threats and abuse against retail staff and annually have a Respect for Shop Workers Week. Alcohol affects almost everyone in society. And for too long, some in Scotland have viewed people with alcohol problems as affable individuals who do no harm to anyone, without taking into account the harm being done to the individual, their families and society as a whole. And we need a fundamental change in Scotland's relationship with alcohol, and we need it now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our final open debate speaker is James Jornan. Thank you very much, presiding officer. I stopped drinking about 20 years ago, and I stopped for a number of reasons. I didn't like the person alcohol sometimes made me, although many of my friends did. I recognised that physically I was struggling to cope with the aftermath of a typical Saturday night session, and I realised, even at around 40 years of age, that unless I stopped drinking, I'd never achieve my full potential. I've no doubt I wouldn't have become a politician and be speaking in this chamber if I was still drinking. It took me almost two years from the time I decided to stop to actually stop. And you know what held me back? What was the hardest part of giving up drink? Not going to total, not the change that drink can make to you, sometimes good, sometimes less so. It was the social pressure to continue to drink. You weren't seen as one of the lads if you didn't drink. The you think you're better than us attitude still prevailed back then. But I've no doubt if I was in the same situation now, I'd have found it much easier to give it up. Thankfully, society has moved on. It's much more socially acceptable to be a non-drinker, and we're all better for it. You don't have to put up with the, come on, just have one, won't do you any harm, blah, blah, blah. Now, I wasn't an alcoholic. I could have taken a drink and, and left it, but I knew that it was not doing me as a person any good, and it wasn't helping me in trying to create the life that I wanted to create for myself. And this was at nearly 40 years of age. 
I have heard stories uh, some from early speakers. I just heard from Mary Fee there about the, the damage that is done to uh, retail workers. Now, my partner is a nurse, and now she works in neonatal, but she used to work in accident emergency. And she tells me that there has never been a shift that she was on in accident emergency where she did not get some kind of verbal or physical abuse, almost without fail, from somebody who is uh, drunk. Sometimes somebody that's, that's in drugs, but almost without fail, somebody who's, who's uh, been drinking. You know, as the Cabinet Secretary said earlier on, we, uh, there's no room for complacency. But we do spend three and we do spend three and a half billion pounds every year in direct and indirect costs related to misuse of alcohol. We need to get that figure down, but we must do it through continuing to change our relationship to alcohol at societal level, whilst ensuring that we continue to support those affected by alcohol misuse. We know that misuse does not just affect the individual, but also families and friends, as well as the local communities. It continues to be a concern that there is still a huge difference between hospitalisation and discharge rates because of alcohol misuse between the most and least deprived areas in Scotland. This is a knock-on effect in these communities, including most prominently with antisocial behaviour related to drunkenness, be that general vandalism, antisocial neighbours, or creating an unsafe environment for people on a Friday and Saturday night. And there can't be one MSP in this chamber who hasn't had to deal with people coming to complain about the antisocial behaviour of neighbours because of uh, their drinking. Tackling alcohol misuse at a community level is also key to changing our relationship with alcohol. And we've heard a lot today about fantastic organisations working across the country to help folk who have got that problematic relationship with alcohol to get the appropriate support and help the, the need in the local community. We, one of the, I want to talk about one FAS, which is the families affected by drug and alcohol abuse. Uh, it is a confidential service. It works in my constituency, but also across Glasgow. It works to help families affected by alcohol or drug abuse, as, as you would expect from the title. They offer support, counselling, advice and information to parents, spouses, partners and adult family members who, due to their loved ones' alcohol or drug problems, are feeling the negative impact which this has on them. I went to visit them and they, they have a quilt. And what happens is that each family member gets the opportunity to uh, participate in putting something onto this quilt. And the stories on that quilt would break your heart. I, they're done by the families who have lost a son, a daughter, a sister, a husband, a father, whatever. Uh, one family had three squares on that quilt because they'd lost three members of their family to drugs and alcohol. They, support, they offer support to kinship carers. The support is the most practical, such as helping them get to the right level of access, assisting with paperwork, and working with their partners, Giza Break, to offer respite. They also run a clothing project, which started in 2008 and has gone from strength to strength. The original idea was to help kinship carers with clothing items for children who were put into care at short notice, because many of these families are affected in such a way that the, there's just one trigger. The, 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 there might well be an alcohol problem for some time, but there's just one trigger that brings the services in and these children have to be protected or else, unfortunately, there's some kind of death in the family or hospitalisation, which means that the children have to be taken elsewhere, usually to a grandparent to be looked after. This service has grown over the years and now FAS offer a, a support to the adult and children as well. FAS is one of the many organisations and support groups working across my constituency and the city of Glasgow to help people with a difficult relationship with alcohol. Finally, one of the most recent ways the Scottish Government has taken a lead on alcohol is through lowering the drink driving limit, which has been mentioned a number of times today. This will undoubtedly save lives, and it appears it already has done so. Mr also, Donnan, could I stop you a minute? I'm going to ask Labour's front bench if they could listen to the last bit of your speech. Thank you, James I'm Donnan. Absolutely shocked and disappointed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, OK, now I can't remember where I was. Right, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I'm, uh, this will undoubtedly save lives, but also goes to show that a shift in our thoughts about drink can change. I'm of the generation that used to think that drink driving was OK. It wasn't uncommon for people drinking at house parties, thinking nothing of driving home despite their condition. And I shudder when I think back to the number of times as a young man, and there were cars when I was a young man, when I got a run home or were driven to a party by someone who now you would recognise was clearly over the limit. This is quite rightly not socially acceptable now. The introduction of this legislation, which has taken us in line with the rest of Europe, has had an impact. Since the introduction of the new lower drink drive, limit, as we have heard, there has been a 17 per cent reduction in offences. 
It is a positive story for Scotland, showing we are leading the way again with social and legislative change in the UK. The Police Federation of England and Wales have recently asked for the legal limit in England and Wales to fall in line with Scotland. And given the impact it's had in such a short period of time here, I hope it's something they consider. The new lower drink driving limit shows that legislative changes can have a positive impact on changing attitudes to drink. The other legislative changes we are looking to make, including on minimum pricing, could have the same impact. Because we're all in this, in this together, there won't be a person in Scotland that hasn't in some way been affected by alcohol misuse, either directly or indirectly. And it's incumbent on us all to do what we can to change this country's relationship with alcohol through changing legislation, challenging attitudes and supporting people and organisations, the police and the NHS who deal day in, day out with the effects of alcohol in our society. It isn't inevitable that Scotland has to have this relationship and we can and will and must change it. Thank you. Many thanks and now we turn to the closing speeches and to Colin Jackson Carlaw. Up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by assuring Mr Dornan that there's been no chatter between colleagues on the Conservative front bench <laughs> during this speech. We have been unanimous in our attention to his speech this afternoon. Um, it has actually been the debate I think I very much wanted to hear, and there are four points I, I, I would like to come to. The first is actually in relation to the Labour Amendment. Now, some of my more free market and libertarian colleagues were somewhat concerned that it was a thinly disguised attack on the retail industry, and as it perished the thought that such a thing could ever be emerged from the Labour benches, but I said, no, not to be concerned about that, but I do want to make the point that initiatives like Challenge 25, for example, did actually emerge from within the retail industry itself and that a lot can be achieved not just by resorting to legislation but by working with other parties uh, to try and bring forward measures which are going to assist the situation. The second point I want to touch on was the one that Jim Eady developed in his speech which again talked about the change in drink driving that has occurred and I posited the slight concern that it might have been that resource issues last uh, Christmas and New Year meant that fewer people were being stopped. Um, but I, I'm, you know, I, I hope the figures are sustained and prove me wrong over the longer term. But of course, the most important thing will not just be the number of people who are stopped and are proved positive uh, when breathalyzed, but that there is a reduction in the number of road accidents and fatalities, which of course have been a cause not by somebody just over the limit very often, but by people who were serially drinking. And if it does dissuade those people from taking that risk, then I think we will see in fact, I think we would be able to say that this legislation had led to one of the genuine changes in the culture of people's approach to alcohol. I can see Dr. Simpson wants to speak. Dr. Simpson. The member might be, thank you for giving way. The, the member might be interested in the fact that some of the United States states, uh, they have breathalyzer locks on cars of people who've been previously convicted and they cannot drive their car without actually ensuring that they are below the limit or absent of alcohol. Jackson Carlo. I'm grateful for that information. At this point, can I just say, and this was the only surreal moment of the afternoon for me, but a Frenchman who was repeatedly saying hee-haw, hee-haw, hee-haw into the microphone really did leave me, as I think both Bob Doris and Sandra White saw, bewildered, as I looked for the berry and onions, thinking that there was some huge stereotypical uh, performance going on. Suddenly it was explained to me this is the name of an al a non-alcoholic drink. Uh, so uh, it's not one that I'd come across, well, I knew nothing about, but uh, I'm grateful for being explained. Um, the, the, uh, the third point I want to make comes back to the culture because I enjoyed most the contributions that were starting to address the way in which Scotland deals with the cultural relationship that we have with alcohol. Um, uh, you know, as someone who came from the motor industry, um, you know, cars used to have a relatively short shelf life. If people had a car that was 100,000 miles on the clock, it was regarded as something of a dangerous old banger that ought to be scrapped. The car I'm driving now has got something like 120,000 miles on the clock. Car lifespans have been expanded, but they've been expanded through the careful care and maintenance of the vehicle over a long period of time in order that people can have that extended life of the motor vehicle. And in that sense, human beings are no different. If we are going to enjoy a much longer life and we want there to be a quality to that longer life, then not just on alcohol, but on tobacco, on obesity, on all the other preventative uh, conditions, we need to find a way to have the public engage more directly with their health. Now, maybe, given the billions that it costs, we should even consider whether the chief medical officer should not be involved in a more direct dialogue with households, trying to point out through the education that we discuss, because Bob Doris said education, education, education. 
much like a politician somewhere else at a previous time, but it wasn't clear to me what that education consists of. And I think we need to try and have people understand if we're not going to deny them treatment, which none of us believe is the right approach, we need to get them to understand what they do and the effect it will have on their lives as they go forward. It's not just as we would like a universal GP attached health visiting service, it's about the whole of life education of people to make sure that they have a more direct responsibility and therefore a longer and healthier life. And the final point I want to touch on, which I didn't speak in, uh, discuss in, in, in my first contribution, is on hospital admissions. You know, of the 40,000 discharges that were alcohol related from hospital, 92% of them were through accident emergency. We know that accident emergency departments are under considerable pressure. We know that there is an aging demographic which is presenting at accident and emergency. And if we can't help to bring down the number of alcohol admissions at A&E, we are simply compounding again what could be an avoidable problem. And that is why I've discussed with the Cabinet Secretary before and commend the Safe Zone initiative which has taken place in Edinburgh, which is a Safe Zone bus on a Friday and Saturday night near the Omni Centre uh, in Edinburgh. They've seen 1,300 people. 60% of those referred to them were done so by Police Scotland. And of those, 42% would otherwise have been an accident and emergency admission. Therefore, accident and emergency admissions that were avoided. Now, there are similar bus schemes in other cities, but they're a bit piecemeal. Their funding is a little bit haphazard. And I think if we want to look at a preventative measure that might not only ensure that some people get home safely later in the evening, which I think is one of the things that Mr. Doris talked about in a slightly different context, but if we want to try and head off what might be otherwise an avoidable entry to accident and emergency, then initiatives like the Safe Zone bus, I think, are things that we should perhaps, as I say, given the billions we otherwise spend, be prepared to invest in, not just a couple of nights a week, but more regularly when the occasion demands, particularly seasonally, to try and help reduce the number of people that present in accident emergency. Um, Presiding officer, I think it has been um, a very energising debate this afternoon. Uh, we've talked some about the particular complicated relationships some have had with alcohol, and these have underpinned many of the actions and initiatives that led, in fact, to minimum unit pricing being passed by this parliament, which we hope will find its place in due course. But it is this relationship, this fundamental relationship, which isn't just about alcohol, but it's about all of these preventative conditions which a generation ago did not have the same impact and cost on our health service or the same impact and cost on human life, which if we can't find a way to get people to engage with more directly on a personal and individual basis, we are going to find not only overwhelming our health service, but fundamentally undermining the quality of life many might hope to expect if that life is indeed longer than it previously was. Thank you. And I now call Dr Richard Simpson. Nine minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by reminding the Chamber that this is not the first time that Scotland and indeed the UK have faced an alcohol tidal wave, or epidemic as the BMA call it. It is actually the third time. And we have actually got through the previous two waves. And we must hope that the decline, which many members have referred to in the number of deaths, hospital admissions uh, and, and other statistics, which have begun to occur in 2003 and have continued with slight variations since, uh, is the beginning of the end of this wave. But I think as all the members have agreed today, it will not happen without our continued effort as a parliament. It will not happen without our continued effort as a society. Uh, the prevalence which has been referred to is, I think, important. There are 138,000 plus or minus 10 or 15,000 individuals in Scotland who are alcohol dependent. That is a huge sum, a huge number. And as Mary Fee said, some of these will actually choose food over alcohol when they are assessing their weekly shop. Now, I want to talk about just one thing that hasn't really been covered that well, and that is the question of data collection. Because those figures are approximations. MISAS, I think, does a good job for us in terms of analyzing what's happening with alcohol in Scotland. But we need to be clear about the data collection. And one of the areas that we have got the opportunity to do this in is the new IT system called DAISY, 
which is being uh, developed by, as we speak by ISD in a working group, that must look at things, as we said we, the other week in the, uh, the debate on caring, it must look at, for example, the role of young carers who are looking after people and families with, with alcohol problems. It must look at the effect upon families and children and how they're affected. 50 to 58,000 children in Scotland will be, be affected uh, by alcohol. Now, we know from the WHO that the two things that will address an alcohol problem best in terms of what a government or a parliament can do are price and availability. When I was the Justice Minister in 2001 and uh, we got the Nicholson Commission set up, which led to the Licensing Act of 2005, that was designed to address availability. It brought in the public health requirement. It brought in protecting children as a requirement for licensing. And the effect has been that there has been some measure of control on licensing, but as Alcohol Focus and others have said, this has been very patchy and we need to address that much more clearly. 96% of all licenses are accepted. That is too many. If 40% more licenses are granted in areas of deprivation where we know there are alcohol problems, that must be addressed. And we must find a mechanism for ensuring our licensing boards have the power, the authority and the money to go to court for when people apply for licenses, and they are very wealthy, some of these supermarkets, they will challenge in the courts, and councils do not have the money to oppose them. So we need to be sure of that. Now, what is happening in our society? The figures have already been addressed by many members, and that's uh, very welcome. But I think some of the important things in terms of cultural change are actually reflected in the Salsus report, uh, which uh, Anne McTaggart quoted from. 19% of 15-year-olds reported they'd drunk alcohol in the last week, down from 34% in 2010. 4% of 13-year-olds reported they'd drunk alcohol in the last week, down from 44%. That is a big change. And it hopefully reflects a change in attitude in the next generation. So maybe the education system is beginning to work. But uh, we've got a lot of pupils in the, in, in, in the chamber today, and I'm not allowed to ask them. But I would love to be able to ask them, do they feel the education they're getting is worthwhile? Because when we introduced it when I was the minister, I was being told by young people from the young parliament, which we set up, that the education was ineffective. It was a bit like sex education. If you were off that day, you missed it. That's not good enough, and we must ensure that we actually uh, deal with that. One thing that hasn't been mentioned today is social norms which has been studied widely in America and which research has been done in the United Kingdom and in Scotland now on. And I wonder whether the social marketing program that the government announced today will actually look at whether social norms tackling young adolescents in terms of how they perceive their peers drinking uh, is actually going to be embodied in that. Because there is no doubt that the biggest influence upon one's drinking as an adolescent is what's happening around you. But it's what you perceive as happening around you that's important, not the reality. And that's what social norms research shows. Jackson Carlo referred to older people and saying that it wasn't just about uh, investment in your pension, but it's investment in the quality of your life as you go forward. That is really very important. As Jane Baxter said, there are, there are cancer and many other conditions that are caused by alcohol, but also by smoking, by being overweight, having the wrong diet. That investment in lifestyle is something we really do have to encourage, but we have to tell people before they get there that that investment is necessary now. Now, we are bringing about change, as I've said. Uh, hazardous drinking, for example, appears to have declined since 2003 from 33% to 22% in men, 23% to 16% in women. This is excellent. The binge drinking in 16 to 24-year-olds 20, has also gone down, maybe partly due to Challenge 25, which the industry have brought in. And the industry has a role to play. I don't deny that. And we need to be in partnership with them. But we need to recognize that they're, what they are trying to do is to sell as much of their product as they can and to make as much profit as they can. So we need to sup with a slightly longer spoon than one would in some other instances. But what they're doing is excellent. They've promoted the uh, community uh, alcohol partnerships, for example, which started in England and are now happening in Scotland. That's very welcome. Uh, they've uh, supported the Drink Aware program, the Serve Right program, the Best Bar None program. There are lots of these programs out there that I would want the social responsibility levy that this parliament has passed to raise the funds for the local authorities to actually encourage these things to happen. And the economy is now improving. The time has come for that to be enacted. We should not delay. 
Now, I have not time, uh, 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 Presiding Officer, to go into all aspects of my bill, but I want to talk a little bit just about one or two bits of it. Uh, but before I do, just to deal with one or two other things that we've, we've, we've got. The alcohol brief interventions, first national program in the world, excellent. But as one of the speakers said, we need to look at, I think it was Bob Doris said, we needed to look at outcomes as well as the short-term effects. We are, I have to say as a parliament, and I'm retiring next year and I may get the chance of a valedictory address, but it will say again and again, this parliament is far too preoccupied with process. It is not sufficiently preoccupied with outcomes. ABBI is good, there's an evidence base for it, it is right we should bring it in, but we must also look at what the longer term effects of it are. And I believe it needs to be focused, and the Cabinet Secretary said in her speech today, we're going to put more money into other venues for this to be uh, addressed. Accident and emergency, the reports indicate, very difficult. There are big challenges about getting the culture changed there, even in recording people who repeatedly attend with alcohol problems. That should be a fundamental, it should happen. You know, in the 1990s, uh, I was on the Chief Scientist Committee when we funded a program to put mental health nurses into accident and emergency as a scientific project. It was successful. Today, talking to Derek Bell, who works in London and is chairman of the Academy of Medical Academy in Scotland now, he said in England he has, in his A&E unit, he has an addiction worker in the A&E unit. And when somebody comes in with an alcohol problem, it's addressed. There are other venues, arrest referral. We have it in five out of eight sheriffdoms. Why is it not in all eight sheriffdoms? To do it in custody uh, uh, make sure that people are picked up and addressed. We, we certainly need uh, to look at our, our specialist services. We have a good record internationally in, in actually the, the number coming to treatment. About 38,000 out of the 138,000 are in treatment. But there are problems in that area. For example, related to alcohol-related brain damage. This is an area of high cost to the health service. When people get to the stage of being admitted to the gastroenterology unit with hematemesis, bleeding uh, as a result of their, their drinking, it is almost too late. But when I did a study in, in Livingston and St. John's, they had 11 different case records for these individuals. There was no coordination. And these people, as I say, are very expensive. I don't have time... Presiding officer, I'm you're shaking you your head, you so I don't conclude. have time. I'm grateful to all the members who've referred to my bill. I hope that people will look at that and, and, and look at the things that we're doing. And I will finish by saying just three brief things. Mary Fee rightly called for family support. Gil Patterson's story about his family was an excellent personal testimony. Sandra White was right to draw attention to the need for community report beyond the immediate recovery. And can I finish by joining Jim Eady, who said, we must welcome recovery and promote those who've recovered as models for, for those who are actually seeking to this. We are in the beginning of change. We need to work together to achieve it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call in Maureen Watt to respond to the debate you have until five o'clock, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank all members very much for their contributions. I have listened to the range of views expressed across the chamber and while we may not agree on everything, I believe there's genuine scope for consensus on a topic which continues to affect our nation so profoundly. Most members mentioned Scotland's relationship with drink. Uh, as many said, it's not, we're not an anti-alcohol na nation. Indeed, many uh, members recognised uh, alcohol's contribution to the economy of Scotland. But we are very much a nation against alcohol abuse and many members very movingly um, told us about their own experiences Christian Allard, Dave Thompson, Mary Fee, James Dorn and, uh, and others all very movingly. None of us wish to see the types of harm which can be associated with alcohol impacting on individuals themselves, on their families or on the communities and our work on protecting children and on tackling alcohol-related violence must continue. And that's why um, the cash back for communities, the 75 million, for example, spent on diversionary uh, activities um, is most important. And I'd like to also mention the, the Lloyds Partnership uh, Drugs uh, Initiative, which, uh, just, just a minute, Mr. Henry, al uh, the alcohol-related close links uh, to ADPs and 
The, over, since 2001, uh, Lloyds have con contributed £21 million to this, and uh, the government itself, 700000 I was going to mention your CPOs. Is that what...? Yes. Um, I, I welcome your question, Mr Henry, about uh, community payback orders. They are very much a robust and credible alternative to custodial sentences, and they facilitate the payback to the communities, but at the same time underlying and addressing the causes of offending. They're not a soft, soft option. They have been proven to work. Uh, individuals released from a custodial sentence of six months or less are reconvicted more than twice as often uh, as those given CPOs. Um, there have been 18,600 CPOs uh, since it commenced, and um, <coughs> uh, sorry, in 2013-14, in compared to 16,100 in the previous year. And uh, I, I was even at a meeting today where offending among young people is dramatically declining. Um, so it has been unpaid work, um, amounting to some 1.8 million hours. Uh, which has been imposed on offenders, uh, f punishment for their offence, uh, but paying back to the communities. So I hope um, the uh, member um, is uh, pleased as I am um, about that. Um, Jamin Edie mentioned uh, Photo Voice, uh, which was on uh, last night in the Parliament and the Serenity Cafe. And I begin with a, a brief reflection on a visit I took a few weeks ago to the Serenity Cafe, although, like many members here, I have popped around there for a quiet bite to eat rather than just being in this building all the time. Um, I was privileged uh, going there formally to see the many local projects assisting individuals in recovery from addiction, be that alcohol, drugs or both. Uh, and on that occasion, I was delighted to see substantial progress being made on a range of individual journeys. And I'm reminded once again of the need for the right local infrastructure, which is essential to, in supporting successful uh, recovery among individuals and being together, helping each other. We've heard quite a lot today about what we're doing uh, at a national level, but a huge amount uh, of what matters happens at a local level. And I know from going out to visit Alcohol and Drugs Partnership uh, and various projects run by the third sector, that what really matters to individuals is the support they receive in order to overcome the barriers to achieving recovery. And what Jane Baxter said about what's happening in Fife uh, reinforces that. I've seen, seen it takes a lot of strength and commitment on the part of individuals to, retrieve, to achieve recovery. So I'd like to pay tribute to those individuals working towards recovery and those uh, supporting them, in particular to our 30 drugs, alcohol and drugs partnership, to the many third sector partners who deliver frontline services, to the NHS staff who work tireless, tirelessly, often in challenging circumstances where alcohol is concerned, and of course Police Scotland. Yesterday I visited Lanarkshire uh, Alcohol and Drugs Partnership and they're leading the way with the work they have done. Uh, and they've won awards and what struck me very forcibly was that they have recovering alcoholics and drug addicts now offering that peer support that is so important because if you have the support of someone who's already been through that journey, that just makes so much more difference. And many of the alcohol and drug partnerships recognise the need to do more, to drill down, to reach out, to offer their services to those who are facing homelessness, offenders, um, those coming out of pr prison. Um, and just today I had a meeting with ministerial colleagues across portfolios um, to see what can be done by all of us to offer the services um, that they need. Uh, we've heard today and spoken today um, about places of safety in the evenings and um, ADPs are locally responsible for assessing what the requirements are in their areas and for putting the best arrangements uh, in place. So it, it, um, some opt for safe zone buses, and I launched the Edinburgh one uh, just a couple of months ago, and we've provided funding for these in Edinburgh and Dundee. But other models are used in other areas like safer streets initiatives, 
with street par par uh, pastors and, um, and taxi marshals in, in some other places. But as Christian Allard mentioned, it's not just about the community's responsibility, it is about our individual responsibility. And it's while it's important that places of safety are available, um, they need to be evidence, and we need, as many have mentioned, to prevent circumstances where these are required uh, in the first place. A society where alcohol consumption and get, drinking to get drunk are normalised is by no means unique to Scotland, but the consumption and the alcohol-related harms we see here are pretty stark. Uh, NHS Health Scotland's MISAS programme, monitoring and evaluating Scotland's alcohol strategy, uh, is, as Dr Simpson mentioned, invaluable in, in this respect. And we know that Scots drink about a fifth more than their counterparts in England and Wales, and that, of course, fuels the much higher levels of alcohol-related harms. Alcohol is now 60% more affordable than it was in 1980, uh, with this trend being driven by the off-trade sales. And it is, I think, disappointing that the Tories have broken um, the link on that and um, that they are not, the, alcohol, the duties on alcohol are not keeping pace with us. I think somebody mentioned the harms that are caused and the costs that that has uh, on the public purse. Um, the Labour benches mentioned the social responsibility levy and it is something that along with our finance colleagues we can look at. Um, pubs and supermarkets still report challenges even although the economy is recovering and um, I think introducing it may not be uh, without its challenges. Um, so, despite falling by 9% between 2009 and 13, including a 2% decline last year, the volume of pure alcohol sold in Scotland per adult has increased by 5% between 1994 and 2013. Um, per adult sales in Scotland uh, have been 17 to 19% higher than England and Wales over the past five years, and this difference has largely been due to spirit sales. Um, presiding officer, in, in conclusion, I think the, what we've, the debate we've had today will, of course, help us in uh, taking forward the, the strategy further. And I return to the World Health Organization priorities for action on alcohol, which was our starting point today. The preventative measures that WHO recommends on price availability, marketing, and in marketing, I have written to my counterpart at Westminster, and I'm pleased to say that the Welsh, my Welsh counterpart is backing me up on uh, the request that we had on advertising. I very much hope we can reach consensus that the next stage of the journey on tackling our nation's relationship with alcohol needs the strong backbone which the World Health Organization priorities provide. I look forward to discussing the proposals in Richard Simpson's bill. And while I anticipate a more formal consultation process on the next phase of our strategy in due course, at this stage I welcome any and all contributions to the next steps. And as Minister for Public Health, I will gladly discuss ideas with all members in the coming weeks and months. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate on making progress on change in Scotland's relationship with alcohol. We now move to decision time. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 13358.1 in the name of Jenny Mara, which seeks to amend motion number 13358 in the name of Shona Robison on making progress on change in Scotland's relationship with alcohol be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 13358 in the name of Shona Robertson as amended on making progress on changing Scotland's relationship with alcohol be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting.